special program I'm going to call Reality Check. My name is Patrick Kamara. You know, the election promises political accountability and service delivery. But tonight we are going to do a reality check. Why? Because we are at that time of the year when more than a million people will be walking around this country, crisscrossing the entire country, asking for a mandate to lead. And most of them will be telling us that they are going to change our lives. And most cases they don't. And for those who are the incumbents, I'm sure the question is going to be, what have you done? And for those who are new, the question is going to be, what can you do? You as a Ugandan, today you have the power. Because you know what? The leaders are malleable. They are coming before you. They are seeking a mandate. And because you have that ballot, if you honor that ballot, you can perhaps add value to your life, to your community, and to your country. But after we have elected our leaders, how many of us go back to ask for that accountability? Yes, we know we deserve better. And so in this reality check, I'm going to be introducing my panel. I have a legal practitioner, Mr. Edgar Tabaro. Welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thank you, Mr. Kamara. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And from Ntungamo <laughs> Municipality, Member of Parliament, Gerard Karuhanga. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kamala, and I'm glad to be here. And from the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights, I have Salima Namusobia. Welcome, Salima. Thank you, Patrick. I'm glad to be here. Good evening, viewers. And uh, we are first going to be joined by Dr. Kabumba Businje, who will be giving us a keynote address in this discussion, sort of setting the stage for us so that we can be able from that to talk. And Dr. Kabumba Businje is a lecturer at the School of Law, Makere University, and he's joining us via the live link. So let us now go to Dr. Kabumba Businje. Thank you very much, um, uh, everyone. I'd like to thank um, PILAC, ISA, and the Corporate Consortium um, on Corporate Accountability, and of course yourself, Patrick Kamara, uh, the moderator, the panelists uh, who will be coming in, and of course the viewers. This seventh conference on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights um, is focused on election promises, political accountability, and service delivery. And it's, it's about um, the extent to which these, these have actually been effected in Uganda. I'd like to begin by apologizing to Ugandans who may have may be suffering from a, an overdose of so myself in the public space. I was just this Monday um, privileged to deliver the Ben Kiwanka Memorial Lecture, and I, it, it was, wouldn't have been my wish so quickly to assault you once again. But uh, I, I feel that this is an important um, conference and an important discussion given the elections that are around the corner. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the politicians, Honorable Nobat Mao, Honorable Karuhanga, Honorable Adeke, should perhaps argue in this keynote, given that they are the people in the arena. Mm. You know, the, the, the famous poem, The Man in the Arena, it's not the critical counts, but the person who fights valiantly. Uh, but be that as it may, I'll, I'll try to um, share some thoughts and insights as a person outside uh, the arena of formal or active politics. Now, in the Benedicto lecture, I I started a, a narrative of certain presumptions on which Uganda is based, our, the story of our country and, and certain assumptions on which our national story proceeds. And then I suggested that a number of those presumptions of the existence of the Ugandan state and the existence of a political legal identity that is Ugandanness are problematic. And I'd like to uh, continue uh, that narrative in this keynote address by reflecting on some of those parts of our story that may hold a lot of truths um, and insights for our electoral experience and service delivery today. I'll just take a look at a number of history books that I have in my collection. Um, and, and I was struck by the titles, Uganda Since Independence, A Story of Unfulfilled Hopes, that's Fares Motivo, State of Blood, Henry Chamber, The Bell is Ringing, Martin Alikere, Combatants, William Pike, Uganda's Unfinished Revolution by Kalinaki. The Patient by Olive Kobusinje. Betrayed by My Leader by John Kazora. The Betrayal by Sam Juba. There's something interesting, and it's just a small sample of the books that have come out um, in Uganda's history. There's a certain theme that runs throughout these books. A theme, a picture of crisis, a picture of betrayal, a picture of a dream deferred, a dream postponed. I'm reminded of the poem called Harlem by Langston Hughes. 
and he asks in that poem, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heaving load or does it explode? The last line of that poem about a dream deferred reflects on the fact that there are a number of possibilities, but it might also explode. So what, hap what has happened to Uganda's unfulfilled hopes, the deferred dreams of this story of Uganda? It's Olaro Tunu who has described the Ugandan state as one depicting complete brokenness. Perhaps this is an overstatement. But I'd like to say that in my view, Uganda is a country ill at ease with itself. It's a country, I think, in crisis that has gone through a number of traumas before and after COVID. COVID-19 COVID seems to be the current discussion, but the crisis of the Ugandan state pre-existed COVID and will exist long after COVID. It's a country of hopes and dreams which have been stifled, which have been deferred in fits and starts since at least 1894, which is of course the date in which the protectorate was declared over Uganda. You could trace this story of the fits and starts of the Ugandan project to the deposition of Mwanga, the imposed agreements of the 1900s and 1901, the 1902 and 1920 orders in council, the Native Authority Ordinance of 1919, the Bataka Risings of the 1920s that culminated in the Busule and Vujolo, the 1933 Bunyoro Agreement, the Trading Ordinances, the deportation of the Kabaka in 1952 and 1953, and the, which culminated in the 1955 Namirembe Agreement. It's a story of back and forth of various peoples who had their hopes their aspirations thwarted at various points in the Ugandan story. In thwarted at various points in the Ugandan story. In fact, it is not unsurprising that we have the first elections of any sort in the Ugandan protectorate in 1958, barely four years to election, uh, barely four years to independence. So you had a whole, more than a half a century of rule without democracy. And that is important because it's, it, it's about a dream that was deferred so long but perhaps it festered. Perhaps it laid the groundwork for explosion. Of course, we then have the series of elections that end up in the 62 Compact. Of course, uh, they themselves being engineered, and we, we know from uh, Luanga Lunigo's book, Professor Lunigo's book, that it was set up to ensure that you didn't have a Catholic uh, prime minister, and you said had an Anglican uh, prime minister in Obote. But those unfulfilled hopes follow post-independence, to the 64 army mutiny, the 1966 crisis, the 1970 Obote move to the left, and I'll, I'll come back to this uh, shortly. 71 coup by Idi Amin, the, the difficult years we experienced then, the 79-81 UNLF period, the war of 1981-1986, and of course then uh, what some have called Pax Musevenika, the period from 1986 to present. The history I've just outlined is one of, as I say, crisis and trauma of, again, unfulfilled hopes, deferred dreams. And that's the story of Uganda. So you have Uganda as a project is a cauldron bubbling with various unsettled issues and questions, all waiting for release or explosion in the language of Langston Hughes. I can just mention a few of these questions, and, and these questions jump out from our history. The land question the Buganda question, the Lost Counties question, the Northern question, the Asian question, the Muslim question. A lot of questions that emerge from a reading of our history. Unsettled questions. One could add the military question. Those are the older questions, but the newer ones are arising. The oil question, the youth, the unemployment crisis. So I, I, it's, it's, it's a, a boiling pot. And this these tensions, these questions manifest in various ways. 
we had the Kayunga crisis in which the Kabaka was stopped from visiting Kayunga. Very reminiscent of the 66 crisis and itself reminiscent of the 52-53 the crisis with Cohen and Mutesa I. The questions about an apology by a person who is accused of killing uh, another person uh, before a whole community. That's itself symptomatic of those tensions, that what would have been a murder is in fact then becomes, a, it creates tension between communities. That's indicative of tensions, unresolved broader questions and broader tensions that continue to be devolved this day. In this situation, I ask, can elections work? Is it proper even to speak of elections in a situation like Uganda? I think not, for reasons I've provided in writing in the book, um, Militarism and the Dilemma of the Post-Colonial State, the, uh, the case of Museveni's Uganda. And this is not just a crisis of Uganda in, in terms of how you position the state and how you plan for it and how you take it forward. As to, as to whether elections will be the magic bullet, I think one has to look at the phenomenon of statehood and post-colonial statehood as a whole. So you take Uganda and you place it alongside Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, and others, India, and you find continuing bubbling tension, assertions of subnational identities, Kashmir, um, uh, Biafra, the case of South Sudan, closer home. It's a story of the post-colony. It's a, it's a story of how you, how a people constitute themselves after a problematic constitution. If you were bound together in a difficult way, how do you refocus? How do you change those bonds to have a more sustainable collective identity? I, I'm not sure that the ritual of election, elections, may be the answer to that broader question. You had, for instance, uh, Bantustans in South Africa, which were a form of statehood, but without the legitimacy thereof. They looked like states, they had the paraphernalia of states, but they, they really lacked a certain ingredient in there. So the question I think I would ask would be, the, the broader question of whether the oppressed can speak, and if they can sp speak through elections. But before I proceed, let me introduce some additional complexity. So I've described, uh, and when I mentioned 1970, the move to the left by Oboti, I, I, I packed it, but I'd like to return to that. That a lot of the history, and in the books I, I, I quoted earlier, there's a story, one story of coups and counter coups and, 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 and unconstitutional changes of government, and it's described in, in military terms, arms and the man, in, this, in the sense of bayonets, and bullets. But there's another story that I think deserves surfacing. The story of capital and constitutionalism. Mamdani has touched upon it uh, in his book Imperialism and Fascism in Uganda, but I think it's something that really needs to be foregrounded. And this is important because the story of Uganda begins as a story of a company project, the story of the Imperial British East African Company, that then is transformed into uh, a state project, but itself also for primarily extractive purposes. And everything that continues from then on is a story of capital and power. Capital and the military. If you like, bullions and bullets. So it is not accidental, I think, that it's very closely following Obote's move to the left in 1970, announced in May on Labor Day, that within a year he was toppled and you had, you had Idi Amin come. Uh, come into power. It's not accidental and it's part of the unstalled, uh, un unexplored history of Uganda, for instance, about the deal uh, that Tiny Roland made with um, the, the, the people in the bush that then allowed them to transform themselves from the, the appearance of being communists to the acceptable um, form that was acceptable to people who could, the world could do business with, and which then allows um, the NRA to capture power. Now, if one appreciates that, one can then 
understand why, for instance, Bessinger's discussion about Odia's death, Odia's death doctrine, and his suggestion that if he took power, Uganda would not pay debts that had been procured uh, under the NRA uh, regime. Why that, in my view, effectively killed his chances of becoming president in Uganda, being accepted as president in Uganda. In other words, the story of Uganda and how power changes hands in Uganda is not complete if one tells, talks about bush wars. The deals were not just deals in the bush, but they also deals in boardrooms. So the, the song Five Years in the Bush is not complete without a description of five years spent in the halls of Washington and in the halls of Whitehall, convincing, making the case to capital, to imperial capital, that why this group should be trusted um, to take over from the other group. Through the agents of people like Kazora, Martin Alike, and others. In other words, there is a, Uganda is in some ways a farm in the animal farm sense, and the elections may not be the only way in which the farm managers are determined and changed. And uh, Kalinaki's book on BSG and his description of his unsuccessful meeting with the Western powers in Uganda here, I think is very telling in that regard. This brings me then to the final dimension of the problem, the presumption of state power in the Westphalian sense, the idea of the state as being this catch-all and this powerful thing to serve a government at Uyambe. And that therefore this state is, is, is powerful. And, and that is problematic on about three grounds. Number one, it doesn't take into account the continuing sub-national identities that continue to struggle for a recognition. The Buganda question, for instance, the Nile Republic, the Yira Republic, Biafra in Nigeria, Zanzibar in, uh, in Tanzania, and most recently South Sudan, which won independence. That's the first problem with that idea or the presumption of state power. The second problem is it doesn't take into account supranational, sarnational, paranational power companies that are very strong in terms of money, in terms of data, Cambridge Analytica, in terms even of military force, Blackwater, MTN in Uganda here in terms of its just sheer scale of power. Finally, the idea, the presumption of an all-powerful government in Uganda doesn't take into account the broader international structure to which this government itself has to relate, in which Africa is a marginal player, with only 2% of world trade, for instance. This is important, because if we talk about service delivery, why there are not drugs in the hospital in Akaseke? Why people are not, students don't access learning materials? Why teachers are not being paid? It's one thing to say the government has not provided these things. But that story is not complete if one doesn't take into account the broader international legal regime, international legal regime, relations regime, economic regime, that makes it difficult even for the government to provide those things. So the presumption of governmental power itself is a very big presumption that may be problematic. In other words, our farm managers have bosses. Our bosses have bosses. And uh, the, we cannot change our bosses in, in, some, in, in some respects without interacting with the bosses of our bosses. I'll give one example. The, the provision, the access to medicines in Uganda is linked to a broader international agreement, the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property. So it, as far away as that international regime appears, that regime is relevant for enjoyment of services in Uganda. And elections, therefore, in Uganda may not be the be-all or the end-all. So in, as I end, in this context of multi-layered slavery, really, I could call it that, or enslavement or entrapment, we may ask, like Gayatri, Gayatri Spivak does, can the subaltern speak? Can the person at the periphery of the empire speak, number one? And if the subaltern can speak in some cases, can this speech be channeled through elections? So, and this, so, so I come to this particular ritual that we have then, the conundrum of elections and the faith in elections and the focus on elections, and it's deeply problematic. And that's why I take issue with my friends who were in the top war campaign, your vote counts, or so on. Because it's problematic, it's a problematic narrative. It doesn't take into account the reality of what we're dealing with. And it can also uh, perpetrate the trap of legitimizing a problematic situation at the national level, but also at the international level. Number one, I think it's reasonably clear that the, great, the truly great questions that we have to deal with, that I have outlined before, the old and new questions, the foundation of the systemic, the structural questions that we have to deal with, the ones I mentioned earlier, the various questions we have to contend with, need 
another kind of response, a long-term response, a structural, deep response. To this end, therefore, elections, I think, can best be described as the one hour of exercise that prisoners get for mental and physical health. One hour a day, you get out to run around and then you get back to the prison. In this context, should we focus on that one hour that we get? I, I, I'm thinking of the song, Mr. Jailer. The jailer who, gets, who allows you to get out for one hour is himself in the prison also. So at times the focus is wrongly on that one hour of exercise and doesn't take into account the 23 other hours of, of, of imprisonment. So in this multi-layered sense of the imprisonment that we find ourselves in, imprisonment at home, but also imprisonment at the state, at the broader international level, what is to be done? What happens? Promises are made. And, and Mao's social media clip that's going around about uh, elections in, in hell, I, I think, speaks pro uh, properly to this. The population also recognizes that they have just one hour of exercise in this 24-hour prison. Grab as much as they can. That's the time they have to extort as much money as they can from politicians, knowing that the next hour will come after 23 other hours. So the prison has also run a bit, people, condemnations are held, and the, the prison warders provide buns and bread. In this case, it's going to be districts, their halls, Operation Wealth Creation. In this time of COVID, these masks and uh, radios and uh, posho. The, the bread that is provided that, that during that limited one hour of freedom. In school, it was visiting day when they give you rice and beef to convince your parents that you're eating well in the rest of the term. But as Michaela Wrong wrote in her, uh, in, in her book, It's Our Turn to Eat, this is, has become a ritual. And I think Katol Obama was, Honorable Katol Obama was most honest when he said uh, his only basis of standing was that the first term, now I'm going for the second term, now I'm going to go. That was the most honest politician uh, say, saying what really is the, is the system. And so for me, the, the question of service delivery and elections, and it's, a, it's, it's in, many, in many respects a peripheral one because it assumes elections can be a solution which in our context, for the reasons I've explained, is deeply problematic. What is required is something that is more structural, more fundamental, more systemic, that addresses the challenge that we have, both at the in, in the internal sense about the structure of the state, but also the external sense about the structure of international relations and how, so internally, how you can bring the citizen to the center. Externally, how you can bring Uganda and other African nations to the center of international relations, international law, and the international economic structure. Those two processes must happen at the same time. Otherwise, what then you have is a continuing ritual, uh, self-deception, um, really a, a celebration of very limited freedom at a very limited time, uh, which may not really be exhaustive. So in, in the final sentence, as I, as I close, it's just really to say this. The five-year ritual aside, there are deep questions we must answer as Ugandans, and, and that will not go away. Questions of legitimacy, questions of uh, autochtony, questions of subnational aspirations. And it seems perhaps time to discuss changes such as a federal structure that might abate or delay uh, crisis or even war in, the, in, the, in this country. It's things of that nature, more foundational solutions may have to be held apart from this ritual of five years in which we know the answer before it starts. I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Dr. Kabumba Businji from the School of Law, Makerere University. I think you have given us such a very moving keynote address. And I'm sure the panelists and all of you who have been watching this, you have been taking notes because he has taken us from back in the days of 60s up to where we are right now and it was important to note that ugandan writers i think they are writing about some of these issues perhaps maybe we're missing them because we're not reading them the deferred dream he called it people have written books like betrayed by my leader the patient uganda's unfulfilled revolution and in fact there's another young man who has written a book i think released last week called uganda without more seven he's called nelson Nkwene. And, you know, even other literary works, like musicians singing Tulikubun Kenke. Maybe a song of hope, Tuliambali Angule. 
even the Bizonto people, I think they are speaking in a certain way. The 30 years of banana. So, yes, we have a tumultuous past. The story of guns and gangsters, bayonets and bullets. And yet, we have a cycle and we have a constitution through which we are supposed to change our leaders. But Dr. Kabumba Businja is telling us this could only legitimize a problem and only becomes a ritual. So how do we turn around the cycle that we have so that Ugandans, yes we know, we deserve better and get what we deserve. That is what we're going to discuss. And I'm going to start with a legal practitioner. By the way, a former Attorney General in Toro Kingdom, Mr. Edgar Tavaro. I have a question. Now, considering what you have heard from Dr. Kabumba Businja, I just want you to make your own, um, uh, how you appreciate that keynote address uh, from the three of you, then we can go to specific questions. Uh, I would broadly say, uh, Dr. Kabumba, brother, who is my former student, I taught him at, uh, at, at LDC. He uh, presents uh, a, a picture of, of a Uganda that doesn't inspire hope. Uh, and, and I want to begin by disagreeing with him and, and have my basis for disagreeing with him. Uh, yes, we've had a tumult as uh, past as a country. In fact, uh, uh, when you talked of the 1981 to 1985 war, you concentrated more on, on the war front. You forgot the six months of transition of President uh, Tito Kelo Lutua. Uh, Kampala city, the city where we are speaking from right now, was divided between warlords. In that uh, between uh, uh, Bugolobi and Serubaga Cathedral, you would go through four different uh, armies uh, to, to get to Rubaga Cathedral. And uh, at the time, Uganda was ripe for a candidate for peacekeeping operations like we see in Mogadishu, in Central African Republic, in Mali and other, 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 other areas. Now, <coughs> 1986 is such a watershed period in, in, the, in the politics and, and, and uh, uh, constitutional history of Uganda. Uh, you may have your issues, but I'm going to lay the foundation for it. Okay. Now, when the NRM, NRA took over power, I think there were about, uh, were there about, were there hardly 10,000 soldiers from uh, the NRA? Then it grew, I think, to I think 80,000, 90,000. Then there was demobilization in 1991. But the character of the UPDF, or rather NRA, which transformed into the UPDF, is not the other original guerrilla movement that we had. When uh, they took over power, they remember there were counter-revolutions. There was Nalu up in the mountains, headed by the late Amon Mazira. There was UPDA, headed by Otemar Madi, uh, Colonel Angelo Okello, uh, late uh, Charles Salai. Immediately after that, LRA. There was the also the Lakuen, Spirit Movement. Holy Spirit Spirit movement. We had UPA, uh, led by Peter Tai in, uh, in, in, in Teso. And, and many, many, many of such groups, ADF and what have you. Now, what is... Is, 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 is critical. These groups were amalgamated. They were integrated in the what? In the UPDF. Now, given the background we've had as a country, where we were a candidate, eh, where we were a candidate for peacekeeping operations, and seeing what has happened over the years, I, I, I think uh, we've laid the firm foundation on which we can build for the future. Two, He's called the election simply a ritualistic exercise. Uh, and indeed, I appreciate where, Mr. where Dr. Kabumba is coming from. I, I, uh, although you don't read me in the newspapers like uh, the Honorable Gerard Karuhanga mm -hmm. participating in, you know, in the trenches of politics and uh, a bit of election violence that we get to hear of in, in Tungamo, but believe me, I'm alive as to what is happening. I've been in Toro for the last three, three or so four weeks, traveling there every week. And I've been studying the trends. Eh? Burahia County, uh, the NRM uh, flag bearership attracted uh, uh, Stephen Kaguera, uh, Margaret Muhanga, and uh, what people call the money bags, Charles Mugans, the former PS of, 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 of works. I, I, I went to uh, Bunyangavu, 
you don't forget that in that in that theater there is also Charles Mwangusha. Uh, uh, but he's not on uh, well well he's that, also running for well, Russia. Well, but is, <laughs> what, what what I'm trying to bring to your attention mm -hmm. is that I've, 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 I'm I'm close to the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm not just a mere legal product, practitioner who sits in an air conditioned office and is really far from <laughs> far with the drone from reality. I've been following, and believe me. Uh, uh, these subaltern people are not as stupid as they appear to the social media, uh, social media, what did you call them, elite. Uh, they know what they want. The keyboard brigade. Yes, and, and, and they voted, they, you know the people they voted out, you know the big names in Toro. I, I don't want to mention. Mm -hmm. I was also in Kasese to, to, to interact with my friend Chan, Chan Masereka, who's, uh, who was running for the LOC5 ticket. And, uh, you know, I was in Kavale. Unfortunately, we had a tragedy in the family, so we lost a, a, a brother-in-law, let some Fiji. So I went to Kavale. I went to Ntungamo uh, on the day of uh, nominations for, ch uh, for the mayor, the, dis the mayor of Ntungamo municipality, who happens to be Honorable Karuhanga's father. I was there, and I, okay. I would just say such a thing. Mr. Tabar, yeah, but you have been trotting the country, I suppose. Maybe so the, the, the point mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring home, I've learned to see Uganda the way it is, not worse than what people see it to be. And believe me, there's a message of hope out there. And I'll be talking more deeply about the issue of elections and civic competence of the citizenry okay. when you give me the opportunity. Salima, I just want to, what do you appreciate from Dr. Kawumba's presentation? Um, thank you, Patrick. Um, just like Edgar, uh, I also want to uh, kind of uh, speak from a hopeful perspective. Uh, Dr. Kabumba presented a situation that kind of indicates that there is not much that can be done um, at the level of our politicians. But for me, I want us to first of all acknowledge the fact that the service delivery challenges we face as a country cannot be understood outside of the political leadership that we have and how we exercise accountability as, as a country. I want us to look at um, the, the issue of service delivery from two perspectives. I agree with Dr. Kalumba and also I will talk about that later regarding the wider global setup and how it affects service delivery uh, at the local levels. But also at the local level, the, the elected leaders have a lot of power and how they exercise that power has a lot to do with the services that we, we have because there are situations where we actually do have the resources, but there are issues that come into play um, like uh, corruption, for example, there is mismanagement that we have to really um, engage with as a country in order to uh, really move forward in terms of uh, service delivery. For me, I would want us as a country to look at um, the election mandates that we give uh, elected leaders as a social contract. A contract whereby, yes, we do give them the power, we agree to pay the taxes, but in return, we expect them to utilize these taxes responsibly and give us um, quality public services. And uh, when I talk uh, uh, about services, I'm using the word public deliberately because um, these are the services that will benefit majority of the people, especially the poor, because we see that in many cases when we have elections, the poor are on demand every leader is running towards you know poor people you see people eating food all of a sudden in Owino going to sit in bars with people and making these promises but after the election you find that um, the elected leaders disappear the policy choices they make as elected leaders have a lot to do with what we get um, I, as, I, as an, an electorate. So you find that after being elected, for example, you will have uh, uh, an ordinary person crowdfunding to be able to pay the, their bill because they've been, uh, for example, detained in Zambia, they could not pay their bill. But what is the elected leader doing? He's flying abroad for treatment. 
and you know the money they are using is money that the taxpayers are bringing on, on the table or money that has been borrowed from outside and uh, we cannot simply run away from that fact you find that also if you look at also our education system for example um, many of our elected leaders have run away from the public education system and they are utilizing private or international schools or having their kids studying abroad and yet the people who have elected them into power are struggling with um, UPE schools that are not properly resourced you know, and you find saying, you know Salma, like everything you're saying Salma is, is gloom and doom I wonder where you're getting hope from after giving us that kind of narrative I mean we, we do have the power as, as an electorate, we do have the bad. power as an electorate and you know this power is a power that stems from the constitution and again uh, there was a critique of the constitution but um, as, as people power belongs to us and this is where it is very important for us to think through the kind of leadership that we bring into office okay. and this is where we should lead, uh, use elections as an accountability moment okay. this where right. people start asking these leaders questions about corruption, about accountability about the failures they had and do not elect back people who have consistently failed us. Okay. Um, I just wanted first to appreciate Dr. Kabumba's um, uh, keynote address, then we get into the specifics. What, what do you make of that well, keynote address? Uh, thanks, first of all, to Dr. Kabumba's um, very great uh, presentation. You know, he comes from a place where largely he rings a reality bell what's pertaining in our country. I have been very active in politics for a few years, maybe if I may say. <laughs> if I may say. Including the guild now, <laughs> I don't know. The quality I, I, of a politician I, is always a few years. <laughs> <laughs> you have just I, I see where we're <laughs> going, heading with Jeremy now, Karang. <laughs> I, I, let, me, let me say this, that I, one thing that we must be very cautious of that we must never be oblivious of the fact that this regime that is leading this country now gets its legitimacy from the bar of the gun. It's the way they came, it's the way they run most of the business, let it be politics. What's even more interesting, even the economics, you will still see the gun around, the military uniform around. That we must not be we must remain alive of that fact if we have got to deal with the situation that is before us. Now, there's something I've not concluded. Is it, it the way how they will go? Well, well, well I'm not yet there, so I, uh, 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 and, and hopefully we just keep hoping that they don't have to go that way. Yes. Now, let me, let me, let me. Uh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go that road. <laughs> so, let me um, work in progress. Say that um, the, 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 it's not that the, the whole hope is lost. That we, 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 are, we are finished people, uh, we, are, we are completely destroyed. I had a tough election in 2016. The one thing that I really enjoyed in that election was that very powerful ray of hope. The old women, the old men, those very humble citizens, had never seen the, the so-called mambas and, 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 and the whole place turned into a girl zone uh, as if it was a war zone. Some had never even seen these, these guns, even in movies. They had never seen them anywhere. But they were able to say, it doesn't matter how many guns you bring, it doesn't matter how many military trucks are around, we are going to elect the person we want. Many of them were beaten, some of their limbs were broken, they would carry. By midday, I did not have probably um, almost, I think, almost 80% of my, my original agents were physically, with military vehicles, picked from the polling stations, taken away, being beaten, and taken to a beating place, which happened to be my opponent's home, who was also driving in a military vehicle the whole day. The, the people said, it doesn't matter. They were that determined. Now for me, that, that, that was a strong message. It was a message to say, look, there is so much that we know it's not going well. That you know, we know there's so much you can do, to even us, even to our own physical bodies. But we still believe we can get better in our country, and this is where we belong as a people. 
Now, coming from, from that positioning, it, it tells that uh, our story as a people, as a country, has a lot that we must tackle. And that's what I hear in, in Dr. Kabumba's presentation. The people in these primaries, the one thing that they had was those who touched the Constitution, they should, they, 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 they should pay for it. It was a message. It may not have, may not have uh, um, been, been uh, uh, overwhelmingly um, uh, the, 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 the very po point across the entire country, but the word was all over the place. And I kept thinking that if the citizens remembered when they're electing us, that actually these parliamentarians or these leaders have a huge role in turning around their plight. That, for instance, if we had a few more MPs in parliament, that the constitution would not have been changed. Then if we, we keep engaging them on that message, and we say it over and over, and engage again and again, and thanks even to the musicians who, who are really coming out to, uh, to, say the, to, to sing the very songs you are talking about, and, and the writers who are writing the books, the moment we keep engaging on that message, then, then that ray of hope is, is utilized to deliver the very leadership that we would want as a country. The good thing I've heard from the three of you is the message of hope despite all the problems that we have. All of you are hopeful. We're going to be joined on Zoom by the President General of the Democratic Party, Chairman Mao. Uh, I hope maybe the uh, Honorable Mao you listen to the presentation of Dr. Kavumba Businji and would want to hear your reaction to that. Then maybe we can put a question or two which is specific. Uh, Honorable Mao. Thank you, Patrick. Greetings from Golo, the capital of the Nile Republic. <laughs> First, I would like to congratulate Isa for convening this meeting. I was only getting tidbits of uh, Dr. Kabumba's presentation. So my remarks will mainly be about the limitations we face in using elections in state building. State building must have a point of departure. Now, in Uganda, our state building project started in Lancaster House. That is the formal state building. When the nationalist leaders were invited like all the other anti-colonial forces, to agree on a constitutional framework. Now, a constitutional framework is very important because it sets the boundaries, it sets the limits of power for those who are going to be handed power. The 1962 constitution was born. It was also contested from day one. Some people felt that the kingdom areas were given a special status, and the kingdom areas felt that they had not been given enough, actually. Now, Uganda was born in those circumstances. Up to now, the main problems we face, what we would call the, the tension between the center and the periphery, the center between the building blocks of Uganda and the unit we call Uganda. These are largely questions that can only be answered through constitutional reform. So elections can only be useful if they deliver a government that is committed to mending the cracks at the foundation of Uganda. Many people are obsessed with elections but the key is, it doesn't matter what game you play. There must be agreement on the rules of the game. Today in Uganda, there's no agreement on the rules of the game. We have a constitution which gives too much power to the president to appoint the referee, linesmen, assistant referees, and basically all the officials that enforce the rules of the game. Number two, even 
the resources that are used by those who are contending for office, the government and the party in power have a monopoly over access to that. Thirdly, the security apparatus is not an impartial arbiter. They seem to be part and parcel and indeed an appendage of the ruling party. Now, that is the context. As I never tire of saying, one of my professors used to say, text without context is pretext. Most of the things I hear now is that it's just pretext because it does not look at the foundational cracks in Uganda. No community in Uganda applied to be in Uganda. The people here in Gulu, where I'm speaking from, never filled out an application form begging to be in Uganda. Therefore, being part of Uganda must be a project that is agreed upon. All communities that feel that Uganda is not working for them will start pulling away from Uganda. Therefore, the central authority will invest a lot of energy to force them to stay in Uganda rather than deploying the resources for development. I believe, therefore, that even as we warm up for elections, even as we are looking for people who want to fill various offices from parliament to local government and so on, the fundamental problem of Uganda will not be solved through elections. It will rather be solved through a renegotiation of what we call Project Uganda. Project Uganda must be based on consensus. So far, the process that had been started of the national dialogue, spearheaded by traditional institutions, the Interreligious Council of Uganda, and even the elders, that would have led to the convening of a national conference to deal with some of the constitutional problems that we face. As far as I'm concerned, a country can only be stable if there is a prevailing consensus. Just like the Lancaster House consensus collapsed in 1966, and just like whatever consensus we had in Moshi collapsed when the Obote regime too took over power, and now we can almost say with certainty that the Luero consensus that was crafted in the bushes of Luero by the guerrillas of NRM and their allies has also collapsed. Uganda must work towards a new consensus. Then elections that are held regularly will be played out based on the basic consensus so that all the players in the political arena have something central to defend. We need something which we can all fight for, irrespective of our parties, irrespective of our ethnic black backgrounds, irrespective of our ideologies. So far, I believe that we are first focusing our energies on the wrong thing. Most of the things that you are talking about, rigging of elections, bribery, inequality of wealth, regional imbalances, corruption, lack of rule of law, lack of respect for the constitution, uh, police violence and brutality. Most of those things are actually symptoms. I am calling upon all Ugandans that we must treat the real disease afflicting Uganda, which in one word is a lack of a durable national consensus. Honorable Norbert Mao, I'm sure you're going to stay with us. Honorable Mao is joining us on Zoom from Ugulu. And uh, we have a panel here in the studio that I already um, in, uh, introduced and you've heard from them. I just want, now, it appears now Mao thinks, maybe pretty much like Dr. Kabumba, that uh, we need a, a real, a fresh start. 
and uh, he also does not believe so much in the issue of elections causing change though we have some kind of uh, hope on this panel L let me now go to specific questions maybe I begin with you again uh, in this segment uh, mr edgar tabaro who who should be held accountable or sh who should we hold to account for promises made uh -oh. is, 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 is it the candidate or the party if an election after an election how does those who come as independents where do they uh, you know stand i'm asking this because we're going into election people yeah, are mr going kamara we are narrowing yes. the whole discussion mm -hmm. to just uh, elections uh, accountability is much wider than than yeah okay than yeah i'm giving an example yeah. because now it's an election and, season and, 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 yeah we are in election season mm. and i don't want us to lose sight of the bigger picture okay go for it uh, I, I i i i tend to be a, 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 an optimist rather than a pessimist I, I see the glass as half full rather than half empty we 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 have we have a foundation on which we can build there's a foundation that has been put in place that we can build on. The 1995 constitution was, a, in a way, a consensus. Yes, there was a walkout. It has been mutilated beyond recognition. Uh, well, 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 uh, through processes that are legal, and uh, some of you have been participants in these processes. But I'll come to that. Uh, a, 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 a government... A, 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 a leadership can only be as accountable as to the extent of competence of civic competence of its citizenry now if it's a citizenry do not demand accountability it is very human i mean we we are we are i believe we are all married here the one who's not married we know very well but i there are rules that ha happen at home you, you know, you, you are accountable to your partner. There, are, you know, there are times uh, you 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 can't come. Uh, you know, you have to inform the person that I'll be late. I'm running late. I'm this 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 and that. Now, w when you don't have such accountability, you you, you get lax. Eh? So the same happens, although it's a, a very a different dynamic, but the rules are the same. If the citizenry are not seeking accountability from the leadership the leadership is going to act with impunity. And that's the area that I want us to address. Who eh? is supposed to build that vibrant citizenry we, we, that can ask for accountability? Me, and is a vibrant citizenry me, not me, a threat Mr. to the status quo? Mr. Mr. Kamara, Mr. Kamara, these things do not fall from the sky. They are created. You have to be purposeful and intentional. You go and look at the other countries that you can compare with. Kenya the civic competence of its leadership, civil society, eh? the changes in the judiciary, radical changes in the judiciary, the way pushed by the Law Society of Kenya. Go to South Africa. Zuma was not kicked out uh, from a, 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 a mere delegate conference. There were processes, even in Becky, there were processes. Uh, Mugabe had become larger than life. He went. Uh, you remember the late uh, Kakamuzu Banda. Now, I'd like to come back to Uganda. The question is, is our citizens civically competent? And if so, or if we are not, what attempts are we making to do so? Two, there are mechanisms to hold our leaders accountable. Some of these individual freedoms that we so much take for granted have come through the court processes. Uh, 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 Mao, uh, uh, the Honorable Nobot Mao, I remember him litigating in was it the late 90s? Uh, he appeared on a part of it was a it was a public a public interest litigation matter he had taken up. But then I want to go even much further behind. Uh, uh, the elder elder statesman, a man I have great respect for, Kawanga Semogere. You, you remember the referendum that ushered in the multi-party system that we are we are we are we are we are grappling with was as a result of intervention of Honorable Kawanga and Honorable Zakalo Rumu, you remember in 1999. And remember the judgment of Bahigene or Kelo, eh? giving certain directions to government to implement what? And also, you remember the disbanding of the, of the movement system under, was it Article 70 at the time of the constitution? Eh? 
Uh, and that's why I, I, I have admiration, great admiration for Male Mabiriz. Uh, mind note that he produces uh, a, a whole fuss of books when he's filing a case. But he's showing, you know, civic <coughs> optics. Mm -hmm. If we had two or three other Ugandans like that, and mind you, using his own resources, unlike civil society that goes, uh, you know, with a funding basket. And I'd like to go further on to, 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 to give my own experiences. Uh, some of them are a little personal, and, and I'll avoid getting personal on television. Eh? Uh, there was a hold of the office of the IGP, and you remember the complaints that were against him. Eh? Uh, you know, I don't want to go into the details, the human rights abuses and what have you and what have you. I, I did represent some victims, widows and orphans, of activities of police officers eh? who were involved in abductions and eventual killings of refugees in Uganda. You know the story. Mm -hmm. And it has gotten me in a spot of bother with the state within the region, and there have been a, a flood of letters concerning me on that. Now, uh, uh, we have a saying in our language, Kinyarwanda language, uh, my, 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 my native, my, my mother tongue, Ushaking her Ararankazu. The one who wants to cause should sleep like them. Should sleep like them. Or mm -hmm. one who wants to be wealthy must be able to do or should do what he or she has never done before. So if we Ugandans want to hold our leaders accountable, there are certain things we are going to what? To have to do. Believe me, by taking on the police, it put me in a spot of bother. Not just with another state, but even my own ethnic community. <coughs> I'm nearly, uh, I mean, excommunicated and uh, that's why I happily identify myself as a person from Toro because I took on one of their what? One of their sons. There's another matter filed for contempt of court. Again, you, because I had uh, Honorable Mao talking about the security forces. Uh, one of the security chiefs has been involved in, again, torture and uh, holding people in servitude in some of the safe houses. I served so him court processes. If we could pause there, because mm. you're talking about civic competence. Yes. Do you think if you raise the civic competence of the people, isn't that going to go against the status quo and become a threat. Will the status quo allow for you to raise that civic competence because it will become the, the, like a the, the state is always in a state of evolution. It will evolve. Eh? It will evolve. And on the Bokamara, some of the prosecutions we are seeing, we've seen big names being prosecuted. Eh? The big man from Shembavri. He appeared in the dock over charges to do with the Chogam related what? And you remember the other big names that appeared, the vice president, then, let, I mean, you can see the incident we have just had from Untungamo. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not as a result of, 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 of the state uh, taking proactive action. It has been the state, what? Reacting. You remember the social media activism and what have you? Eh? And that is what I'm trying to emphasize here. We've established a dispensation. Eh? We've established a dispensation that can be answerable to the people. The question is, are we engaging the mechanisms? Are we engaging the structures? Are we going to court enough? Are we calling these MPs to order? That is the question I keep asking myself. I mean, many times we sit back and, 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 and throw our hands up in the air, almost in surrender. But I've studied Uganda quite, for quite some time. And I've seen its responsiveness. Eh? Its responsiveness. Election violence in Intungamo is not a recent is, uh, occurrence. It started actually as early as 94, involving principally the same players, although some of them have passed on. But because the citizenry at that time did not call for leaders to account, eh? The, 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 they let it go and impunity set in. On this occasion, Honorable Kamara, you'll agree with me, you, show, you saw the reaction of Ugandans and you saw swift reaction on part of the what? Of the government. So what I'm trying to bring to the attention of the people out there is that the government can only be responsive if we engage it. Okay, I think uh, uh, Gerard is itching with something to respond before I come to Salma. You see what uh, um, uh, uh, Buyana Tabaro is, is referring to is what I can quickly call political veiling of this regime. For such a long time, 
the regime has given us some some bits of showing some bit of of, of elements of accountability that we are we, we are accountable but that you know we can arrest a few we, we, we can charge a few let's be very uh, more let's be be, be be deeper and keener accountability for me does not come from a regime in 2005 that pays 5 million shillings members of parliament to change the constitution. It does not come from a regime that invades parliament, in this tense parliament, amend the constitution for the benefit of an individual, the president. Accountability for a regime does not stem from a government that invades a kingdom in Kasese, in their broad light and kills hundreds of people. That's not accountability. What we see, and, and I think this is what this is where Dr. Kabumba was coming from. He 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 wanted us to discuss the, the reality that we face as a country. Not say that we, we should we are hopeless that there is no hope. No, that we need to address the reality that that we cannot keep in this semblance of. You see that there is this uh, um, uh, metaphoric expression of how how cow dung dries on top, and and it all looks very dry. You just need to step on it a bit. And then you'll see the stench that you'll get out of that. So we, we, we need to be honest with each other more and, and say, look, we have these little bits of, of engagement. Um, I, I, I have had the opportunity of sitting in the Public Accounts Committee for about seven and a half years. I have seen cases that are unbelievable. You have a permanent secretary. He's given billions of shillings, <coughs> procure vehicles for all district chairpersons in Uganda. The fellow does not buy even a single tire for a single vehicle. <laughs> and he still walks the Kampala streets. So, no, so no. Uh, uh, and, and that is, uh, and that is a regime. That, 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 that's a, uh, and, and we, we should an, call that accountability. Let, okay, let me, let me bring it. So, we, we have an agency of government yes. or a department called the Auditor General's Office, which does, you know, looks where the money is going. We have accountability committees of parliament. All of them are headed by the members of the opposition. Because that's the unpack. Where you sit. So is it you make recommendations that are not implementable? What happens? Because you cannot just be as a member of parliament, sit and uh, agonize with us, yet your job as a leader is to organize. You know, um, the one thing that I, 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 I've really uh, come terms with, that if there's anything this regime has mastered, is give impressions. Uh, work around giving people impressions that we are, that, that we are a caring government, that um, we, we, we can actually uh, pursue corruption or corrupt individuals, um, that, um, that we even care so much about your plight, that you, we know we shall make sure there, is, uh, uh, there are health facilities that are very functional. It, it has all been largely a window dressing. Look, uh, you know, having, ha having been in that committee, the Auditor General writes interesting reports. He really tries as much as he can to put what he finds to the public. We write reports as committees of parliament. Very interesting reports. In fact, initially there was a question of saying, oh, we write generalities. That we don't, we, we moved and said, okay, let's be specific. Say, so and so, uh, uh, in our opinion, uh, this evidence uh, should make him culpable and, and therefore should be charged or should be pursued by the Inspector General of Government or by police or by the DPP. And ev almost all, all the four accountability committees, every month probably will raise a report, each one of them separately. Now, as to what is done to those reports, as to how many people may have been charged, or to how much money has been recovered, or to what example we are, we are showing to the rest of the nation, is, is a complete different picture that the regime has worked so hard to impress upon Ugandans. That, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and this is not really sounding just uh, uh, critical of the regime. It's factual. You, you know, you, you have a case after case after case. And in fact, it comes, uh, uh, sometimes you even sympathize with those that are working in critical offices. Because some cases when they are pursued, and then you see phone calls <coughs> come through, and then people are put under uh, threats and intimidation when somebody is really doing his, his legitimate duty. Uh, I, 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 I was not surprised when uh, um, Bayanatawa said he was pursued 
for actually representing clients, you can imagine. For representing clients, uh, uh, he, his profession demands so, his con our, our constitution as, as, as a people grants those rights, but, but just representing them, that becomes an issue for an individual. So, so for me, I, 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 I think. The from outside Uganda, not from well, I, <laughs> well, well uh, since since the, the regime didn't deal with it to secure you as a professional, oh, or maybe they did. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so for me, that speaks volumes of what we are facing as a people. Okay, uh, Salma. Uh, when you want to react to that, I also oh, want to inform about this as well. Yeah. That that you have the Auditor General, you have all these people, members of Parliament, and four accountability committees. I think all of them headed by the opposition. You have the DPP, you have the Attorney General, you have the Minister of Integrity and, and all this kind of stuff. You have the, the state, state House and corruption thing. All these are facilitated and paid by government. But actually, we are not even seeing the dividends. That is true. And that takes me back to the conversation that we were having. And uh, Dr. Kabumba mentioned it. Bringing the citizen to the center is an important thing. And one, uh, one thing that is missing in that equation is the social accountability. Because the whole story of the Auditor General, the Parliament Accountability Committees, they are all looking upward, you know they do not really take as important going back to the population to account. You see, even in situations where, for example, uh, the NRM was recently uh, going through reviewing their performance under the manifesto, but they sit by themselves in, in their own rooms and start going through the manifesto and come up to the conclusion that we've actually performed well under the circumstances. So uh, I think part of what needs to be done is to uh, really um, incorporate social accountability into our legal framework, a situation where even the Auditor General uses the public to speak to the accountability, but also, like I said earlier, to call upon the public to use their power. Because even if these issues go to Parliament, Parliament, if you look at it, for example, right now, uh, the majority are NRM, if you know an issue really became sticky, they will be called to a caucus, and it will not be very helpful. So we have to use those moments where, as um, the public, we do have the power to call these uh, elected leaders to account and one such moment is the election like we've been saying but also uh, continuously then the other thing is the disappointment with the political parties I think uh, after elections the political parties do not maintain that oversight over um, the opposition political parties over the ruling party and you know you rarely find political parties engaging on issues of, <coughs> of accountability of service delivery you know they are always discussing things financing for the political parties in iPod and whatever but we've been telling them you know if only you could start discussing issues that touch the ordinary person as FDC, as NOOP, as DP consistently, not waiting to um, a point where you're supposed to be elected to start talking about these issues. So they should be able to also join the accountability and do not leave it to members of parliament, for example, because as we've known, this is not going to yield much. So from outside, if political parties are going to talk about things that touch the common man, health, education, electricity, water, the people are going to join them and you build momentum towards the next election uh, that is really legitimate, that is coming from the people, and you would be able to, uh, to be voted into power. But as it is at the moment, I think there is also failure on that front, which uh, contributes to the gaps in accountability that we, we have at the moment. Yes, Mr. Mr. Kamara, if I could come in quickly. Yes. yes. I, I've read the book, which I believe you've also read, Martin Meredith, The State of Africa. It gives a landscape of uh, the whole of Africa from uh, immediate uh, pre-independence, immediate post-independence up to the present day. Uh, when you look at the dynamics in the other countries and what we've gone through as a country, honestly, I, I, I don't know whether it is false hope, but I have, I have hope in this nation. And it's the reason why I, I'm still around. I've gotten opportunities to go away, either for exile or relocation and what have you. But I've chosen. I wonder to stay how that becomes Uganda. an opportunity. But uh, well, <laughs> I mean, when you're being threatened, you know, sometimes these things become. So that, it has gone to that level, right? 
think Mr. Kambara, you know these things, you just don't want to acknowledge them. But <laughs> uh, this is what I want to bring to your attention. You, you do recall uh, uh, Mbide of, uh, was it Seva Wasoka? There was Mbide, there was I think Adrian Insubuga, and what have you, you remember? Back, it was in late 90s, early 2000s. Eh? Uh, they made a deliberate and intentional effort to clean up the soccer in Uganda. You remember? Okay. They even took out private prosecutions. You do, you do remember where the president and vice president of FUFA were what? Prosecuted for corruption. And from then on, the soccer, you know, things began getting better. And we appeared at the AFCON uh, subsequently twice. Now, uh, that did not fall from the sky. They took deliberate action. Now, the Honorable uh, Gerard Karhanga says he has been on the park for seven and a half years, and they've written reports and reports. Uh, I, I, I want to even uh, 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 bring it to, uh, uh, further to your attention uh, that under the NRC, uh, uh, NRC, the, 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 the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee was the late Waswan Karovo. There are reports of them that are yet to be, <laughs> I think, tabled in Parliament. Then I think the one who followed was the Honorable Augustine. So he's hoping, for, he's hoping for, for too much? <laughs> for, 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 <laughs> and I know that he's hoping for too much. I'm giving him solutions. <laughs> I'm giving him solutions. That the law permits private what? Prosecution. Now, you have an Honorable Karuhanga here with a wealth, eh? with a wealth of evidence. And he's a trained lawyer. Wealth of evidence. So the permanent secretary has been allocated money to go and buy brand new vehicles for cars in the country. And he says it does not even uh, uh, procure uh, the tires for, 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 for those cars. Now, you have all that evidence lying there. And you have Mr. Karuhanga coming here on air eh? with all the capacity and the knowledge that he has. And he's telling Ugandans that we have failed on that front. See, uh, uh, that, that does not inspire. Well, that's about, you forget that there's the, the, the essence of institutions, the, the purpose why institutions are created. The reason why taxpayers, these ordinary people, spend coins every single day to make sure that individuals in the, inspector, in the inspectorate of government are paid, the DPPs are paid, the police are paid, that even the parliament is paid. They, they don't do it because they think there are no individuals who can do this work. They know, they appreciate the, 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 the very constitution that we all respect, especially the one of 95. We all know that there was a, a very deliberate effort to entrench institutions. Why? We know countries, nations are built on institutions. So I have been caught. I, I took on government when, <laughs> when, 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 when the president wanted to, to reappoint the chief justice who had clocked retirement age. I won that case. I went to court when parliament was trying to award, uh, when members were trying to award the 20, million shillings. the 20 million shillings. Thank God the, the case is still in court, but the, the, the best bit, we won it. Now, you, you, you I, 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 I can give you another, can give you another well. example you, of a very you, un unbelievable you case. You can deploy the same. If, if, you recall, <laughs> if you recall the appointment of the deputy chief justice. Now retired. Now retired. Stephen Kavma. The constitution is so clear. The Judicial Service Commission interviews and recommends the president. The president appoints, parliament approves. This man never, never sat any interviews. He was never engaged by the Judicial Service Commission. The Judicial Service I, Commission I have contra, never recommended. I have, I have a contrary information. Never, never. I, 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 have, I have all the information. I, 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 I even have minutes. Again, I was caught over the same. Mm -hmm. And... And guess what? The, the, the acting, then was acting Chief Justice, ensured that our case and the, all the documents, in their broad right, even when they are cameras, he instructed no officer of court to receive our case. We ran back to Parliament and said, look, you probably saw this. Our case could not be received, but we want this to be questioned. Parliament, again, the empowerment of the institutions, because we had insisted earlier that the Public Accounts Committee should be public, should be open to the public. Never gave us attention for the same. And eventually the same individual was appointed Deputy Chief Justice, substantively, 
And, and, and so th that's the regime that we want to give an impression. So, Salma, what, 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 what Honorable really? Kalanga is saying? Just, just, no, just a quick no, 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 Mr. No, no, no. There's an undeniable sense. We, we do have, uh, I, have, I have the advantage of belonging to no. WhatsApp groups of uh, numerous, uh, what we call practice groups or clusters of the Uganda Law Society. And they send out a general email of, uh, of cause lists. Uh, I, 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 I think I should add you to that group. And you see the number of prosecutions that are going on at the anti-corruption court of civil, serv of civil servants and persons in position of public trust. It's not as bad as you are presenting it. Yes, we always, we, we always demand better and we should demand better. I but it's not yes. true. But there's an uh, element of impunity. Total, in some cases, disregard of the institutions and laws that I think is rising. Yeah, but um, also um, Edgar is putting a lot of faith in the judicial system, and yet we've seen that actually there's lots of inefficiencies in that system. And I'll give you First of all, you, that you, talk about, that. you talk about the private prosecutions, but we've also seen cases that are taken up by the DPP afterwards, and they are not uh, very well handled, even where citizens have taken the initiative. But then um, also regarding what uh, Gerald is talking about, there are many cases that are within the system in the judiciary that have never seen the light of day uh, simply because you have no capacity to go and negotiate to put a particular case on the table. So um, for me, I wouldn't want us to make may, maybe focus on a particular avenue, like to say maybe if we engage in litigation, this is going to happen. I think there has to be a hybrid of avenues. And yes, one would start with reforming uh, how the judicial system works. There is lots of improvements, yes, but there is still a lot of inefficiencies that make many people within the public to still not trust the institution of the judiciary, and uh, we need to address that. But outside of the judiciary, we also have to add other mechanisms. Um, of accountability and um, I have to really emphasize this and my hope is really in civic engagement if the people show the, uh, the leadership that we are tired of the impunity the leadership will be responsive and uh, this has to be done also you know like there has to be uh, engagement there has to be leadership there is a role for civil society to play in this there is a role for the Human Rights Commission to play in this but it is the public that will out ultimately send the message to the political leadership that we've had enough of okay. the impunity uh, okay. and it can, has can, to stop. Uh, in this cycle of election, Mr. Tabaro, can that happen? Can the public send a message and say, enough? Let, let me start on a certain premise. If you have the frame of mind, or if you have the mindset that we are a failed state or a failing state, you are not going to produce results the results you're going to produce will be reflective of your state of mind. And I'd like to give you an example, live example. Uh, there is a, you, and you can go and check the court records. A young man we represented in court, uh, I'm not revealing client secrets, it's a public record, Mr. Hamid Chisitu. From Kawepe, his phone had been stolen, uh, he raised an alarm, and people gathered and uh, beat the alleged thief, and the thief died. The boy, in his very early 20s, was arrested and arraigned for murder. He had spent uh, three years without trial. And uh, his liver was failing. As such, uh, we, we, we happened to be, it was a pro bono matter. A, a young Muslim boy from Kawempe, but got to know us through some of, one of our, our in-laws. You know, my family has, uh, really picked brides and grooms from all over the country. <laughs> what do you have to? <laughs> we, are, we, we are that open. You are making United <laughs> so, Nations now. Okay. So now this, this, uh, no, this, uh, this young man, Mr. Chisitu, we applied for bail, for his bail. We, are, we filed on the 23rd of December 2016. There was every reason to believe that we were engaged in, in some utopian exercise. Mr. Kamara, we served the DPP on the 23rd in the evening at 4 p.m. At 10 a.m., the DPP sent a representative. The matter 
had been fixed. Uh, at that time, there was a registrar uh, who did wonders. He's, he's now a judge. Uh, I don't want to mention names because of the legal fraternity. But he, he did wonders and got accelerated uh, promotions because of the, of the reforms he had initiated in the criminal registry. Now, the representative from the DPP came. The judge had and determined the matter. Previously, we had been told that that judge never grants bail in murder cases or in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, people. Be, cap, yeah. We got bail for that boy and saved his life. Now, the previous mindset from which we were operating was that the Ugandan judiciary is terribly inefficient and cannot be able to deliver to this level. And I have many other similar stories where you begin on a premise of that it, is, it cannot be done. And I also have stories where you begin on the premise, on the premise that it shall be done and can be done and it works. So the question I'm putting to compatriots out there is that let us engage the system. Eh? Let us engage the mechanisms. Let us test them. If we are going for elections and the people who have not delivered their promises, I've already seen in Toro, those ones were not delivering. You saw, I don't want to mention names. They were voted out. I, I, I'm told uh, it's a trend also in other areas, but I want to talk about what I'm familiar with. Otherwise, I'll be speculating. Oh, now, now um, Salima, in practice, how do elections really affect service delivery? Well, um, like I, I said in the beginning, the choice of leaders, the leaders that we have, um, are the ones who are going to sit at the table and partition, for example, the resources available. Mm -hmm. So whether it's at the national level within parliament, whether it is um, at the local government level, it is those leaders who are going to sit and say maybe, for example, let's have a school here, let's have a hospital here, let's uh, this uh, person go and run this particular, uh, this particular school. So if these people are not um, engaged and are not committed to service delivery, then definitely, even the little money that they raise is not going to be put to good use. But also um, the choices that they make. For example, there are those who will outrightly, um, and this links also to how, for example, elections are financed. Mm -hmm. In many cases, we see that companies, for example, will finance some uh, mm -hmm. e elected mm -hmm. officials. And in return, they expect favors. And many times we've been in districts where uh, companies have threatened elected leaders to say, if you do not give me this concession, if you do not give me this contract, I'm going to finance the, 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 your opposition. And indeed, they will do it. So um, the money that is put into these elections and its source is also important because many times the source of the money, which uh, sometimes is either uh, powerful individuals or powerful companies, will will come back to get something from the system okay. and many many times it is uh, derailed but also um, you have to look at um, the other aspects of uh, for example the vote buying this makes uh, leaders feel like um, they do not owe the electorate anything. After all, I bought your vote. So once I'm in office, you cannot come to me to ask for something else. I paid whatever it was, and what I'm supposed to do now is to recover the money I put and into the election. that's because you have met people who lack civic awareness. Yes. You know, like, uh, they will simply say, I paid my dues at election time. It is time for me to recoup those. And definitely where they are going to pick that money from is the basket that is meant to go towards service delivery. Okay. Hon Honorable Jared Garohanga, why do politicians forget their promises? Why can't they <laughs> make good of their promises? Do they forget? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Is it forgetting? <laughs> 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 the the, the <laughs> 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 of it is, 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 is so polite that uh, <laughs> you, that you're probably um, maybe because you are sitting next to a politician. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think it's very easy to promise um, for most of us. Uh, it's very easy to uh, to speak out for purposes of persuading an audience uh, to to follow your 
your support base or support you. But uh, I want to believe that Ugandans have been very keen, especially when it comes to parliamentarians. I wish it would also happen for the presidency. Um, that when, when you promise on, on a number of things, they keep watching, but they also keep the memory. When you come back, they ask you, you promised a bridge here, you promised water here, you promised uh, electricity here. Where are all these things? And um, but as a member of parliament, I, 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 why would you promise something like that? Because that's way beyond your mandate. I, I, th th that's again a big mistake. That we, 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 you know, there has been a trap that we've been um, we've, we've been caught in, all of us. Uh, that if you don't commit to the lobby for bigger projects, um, and then therefore people don't think you have any manifesto or that you are you mean to help them in any way. And, and largely it's because of the efficiency of, of, of the executive. The inefficiency of the executive is suffered by the parliament, by the legislature. Because why? The legislature, even by its nomenclature, it's to make laws. Represent, okay, there's a lot of representation and accountability, which is oversight, but the primary role is to make laws. And, uh, and so, because certain things have not been done, uh, and why, why, why don't we have public service delivery? Why don't, why, as a people? I, is it that we are too poor that we can't fix most of these challenges? Maybe not, and actually not, because when you think about it, the, the, the biggest privilege, the, 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 the siphoning of public resources and the wastage, because there are, the, there are two aspects. The, the, the wastage and then the corruption. Those two, as long as they remain at the, the, the skyrocketing levels they are at, however much we, we sound so strong on issues, however much we try, however much we try to sugarcoat and try to paint a picture that, is, that indeed there is indeed, and then there is hope, yes. But if those are not dealt with decisively, then we have a challenge. However, there, there, is, there is something that I still believe the, the electorates can remind us, all of us in this country. About three and a half years ago, government came up with um, an idea to tax people uh, in small towns. And so they came, with a, they came and, and, and went all over the whole country. So I'm in Ntungamo and I meet I meet the people in Ntungamo all upset that they had, there was this demand of taxes that were un, un, unsubstantiated, that were unbelievable, especially the amounts. So I looked for the law, I got the law book, checked, and there was a huge error. I knew that this was a mistake, that this tax could not be corrected. It could not be collected, and so I, what I did was make a photocopy of that page. And I saturated it all around the entire municipality. Initially, people were concerned, say, oh, you are going to be arrested uh, for failing tax collection. I said, no. I am only reminding people that there is a law that protects them against this tax. In less than two days, the fellows that had set camp in Ntungamo to collect tax and the neighboring districts all packed their bags and returned to Kampala. Now, the people, Recently, when we were, we were engaging in meetings, I, I, this is not something I probably had, I would still even recall. So when we were discussing, so one of the, the, the businessmen says, you know, Gerald, sometimes you, pour, you, you go and you promise us so many things, but there are certain things that you even bring out and you think that we, we, we forget. And so uh, they reminded me of that incident. And I said, well, it's, it's good that people actually can hold us accountable, that you can, that if you, you deliver on an issue, they can remember it. But if you also promise to deliver on an issue, they will also still remember that issue. So increasingly, and, and, and thanks to the media, um, the, the, the numerous uh, um, uh, um, media houses across the country, um, the humble citizens that have spent their humble money to educate their daughters and sons, you can begin seeing it now, that people are beginning, it's, it's still uh, a very uh, slow process, it's, they are still really, really baby steps, but you can begin to see that uh, uh, gradually people are beginning to say, but wait a minute, you promised this, you promised that, and we don't see it. Okay. Mm. Um, as we try to conclude our discussion, Edgar, on the scale of one to ten, on the promises made, 
by the end of 2016, if you had look at their accomplishment as a citizen, but also as somebody senior, what would you give them? Uh, One being the lowest. Uh, th th there are many variables that I would deploy. Uh, because uh, whenever we're going into election session, uh, election session, uh, the, the government makes numerous promises. Eh? Uh, infrastructure, incidental infrastructure is 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 is, is a song President Museveni has been singing since way back. And I'd like to give you just a little bit of history. 91, 92. It's a it's a clip that has been going around. Eh? Uh, President Museveni. Keith Mohakan is, I think, was the economic advisor to the Minister for Finance. Uh, Michael Kamdesas, the IMF chief at uh, uh, the Paris Club. Eh? And, and Museveni was making a case for investing, for, 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 for infrastructure, what? Financing. But, uh, uh, you, you know, the neoliberal reforms, uh, uh, the things we are addressing were never uh, social impact, uh, impact projects. And, and I remember President Museveni deliberately reforming the Uganda Revenue Authority, starting with the LABICL as the Commissioner General, mm. uh, you know, to start it off, and uh, subsequently other people came on. And uh, if, the, if there are any things President Museveni does not joke around with, uh, issues to do with security, collection with taxes, collection of taxes. Well, and eh? they they complement each other, don't they? I wish he was also very keen on the expenditure of the taxes. Uh, uh, the taxes. Uh, yes. And you see, that, that is where the challenge where is, yes. and it will continue yes. being a challenge. But okay, because we have a team, we have a, a team that sits at Apollo, Sir Apollo Kagura Road. Typical neoliberal for, uh, neoliberalists. Then you have a parallel system run by President Museveni at State House that is typically coached. Eh? in the state intervention, uh, Marxist economic okay. theory, yeah, just that, that dualism, it can never be closed, I'm afraid. Th that, uh, that contradiction will continue for a while. But uh, I think I would give him 70%. All right, uh, Edika, uh, uh, Gerard, and uh, Salma, let me very briefly go to Gulu, where we have, uh, the only one who has been listening to this and has been with us. Maybe he will be giving us the parting shot in this uh, 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 part of the discussion. Mao, you have listened to the colleagues here, the panelists, what do you make of um, their own submissions? Yes, Honorable Mao, I'm sure you have listened to these uh, panelists in the studio. I wonder what you make of yes, their I submission. Have. Okay, go right ahead, sir. Since I'm the only party leader around <laughs> this program, let me respond directly to what the ED of ISA said, that is Salima. I want to confess, I think many of the political parties are focused on the election season. They, they behave like pythons. During the elections, they are very busy. Then they go into hibernation until the next election when they wake up. So it's like they are driven by hunger for public office. I want to pledge that that is going to change, especially in the party I lead. Secondly, on the question of blaming the opposition for lack of vigilance. I know that constitutionally, the opposition chairs the accountability committees, like PAC, COSASE, Government Assurance Committee, and now there is a demand that the opposition should also chair the Human Rights Committee. Those committees have always brought very good reports to the floor of the House. But the discussion of those reports usually are suppressed. The other failure, which is structural, concerns appointments. As you know, 
Uh, I'm sorry, Kamara, there is some heavy rain here in Mugolo. It, it's okay, those so are that blessings. Is the, that is the background noise you are hearing. So, the appointments committee in Uganda is chaired by the speaker. And it brings together leaders of political parties and a few other appointed members. The process of vetting candidates for public office is opaque. The public is not allowed to know what is going on. If we can televise court sessions, why can't we televise the vetting of those who are supposed to hold sensitive offices like electoral commission, the judiciary, heads of government, departments, ministers. So those reports remain the property only of the vetting committee. The parliament sitting in plenary only rubber stamps those reports. I think we would have a higher quality <coughs> public service if the vetting of public officials is open to the public and also televised. Kenya has managed to jump that hurdle, and I think we should go the same route. Lastly, is about the role of citizens in demanding accountability. It is true that the demand side of our politics is very low. Even when you talk to the LC1s, they will tell you they're waiting for things from above. <laughs> When you talk to the districts, no, but, but, they, 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 know you. they claim that they are waiting uh, for uh, things from above. No, 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 no. The, sup the supply side of our politics <coughs> is too strong. The demand side is too low. But let me offer some suggestions to the likes of Salima and the civil society and the general public. I do believe that it is correct that during an election season, citizens have an opportunity to demand accountability. And they can do it more creatively by not waiting for the politicians to convene the meetings. I'm sure if ISA organized a town hall, for instance, and call the mayoral candidates for the divisions of Kampala, say Kawempe, and say, look, we want those who are contesting for position of mayor of Kawempe to come and address a town hall. Kawempe has Makere University. Kawempe has the uh, Wandegea. Kawempe has lots of, uh, of residents and upmarket locations. These people would then be held to account publicly. The same should apply to all the organizations. I look for the day when Casita, the Kampala City Traders Association, would start organizing meetings and calling political leaders to present their programs. I think that would make politicians respect citizens more than they do now. So I call for, an, for the strengthening of the demand side of, uh, of politics so that politicians know who they are true masters are. Okay. But as of now, an election season is driven by those looking for votes and they choose their audiences. They even carefully craft how the messaging will be done. All right. We thank you so much, President General of the Democratic Party, the Honorable Nobat Mao, who has been joining us via Zoom from Gulu City. We thank you so much. And it appears, as we conclude, I think he agrees with you that we need some civic uh, competence. competence. And if we get that, probably that's the holy grail. I, if reach the I attended the same school with Mao. <laughs> Namiango College, so it shouldn't surprise you. Okay. Where he was head boy and I was head boy at some time also. Okay. <laughs> so it appears that is the missing link. Mm. If we get that, probably mm. we shall be moving forward into realization where the people can get what they want. What they want um, Your yeah. parting shot. Uh, it all starts with the mindset that you have. For us to be able to transform as a citizenry, for us to be able to develop the culture 
of holding our leaders accountable, we are going to have to work on a mindset change. But if we are going to continue with the mindset of uh, what is the tutorial word? Ksoboka. You remember what uh, Ruhunda used to tell us? Nikwaraki, Nikwaraki. It's possible. It's possible. And it happened. Not so. So if we can have the same mindset of Honorable Alex Ruhunda. It is possible. It is possible. We shall get to the promised land. Salma. Okay. Um, I just want to call upon uh, the electorate, the general public out there, to learn from their mistakes in the past. You know, we've voted people into power that haven't delivered on their promises because as the electorate, people expect quality, efficient um, public service provision, which is, in many cases isn't being delivered. So for me, just to remind people, we have the power, we are voters, and we should be able to exercise that, uh, that power as voters because the people we put into office have a lot of power to decide what services we are going to get in the future. And of course also to agree with uh, Edgar that there has to be um, civic engagement and a robust framework for social accountability that really uh, brings back these elected leaders to account to the general public and not simply to account to the auditor general or other people so um, calling upon people I'm saying you know it is not hopeless we have the power we can do something and we need to really put these leaders to account do not elect leaders who failed you in the past Honorable Karwanga. yes the great hope that we all look forward to and need as a nation lies with our people I feel it I see it all we need to do is ignite it, energize it, and give it more space. There is so much that we can achieve as a people. If we collectively, on a number of occasions, keep on engaging ourselves on things that we want to change from leadership to economics, day by day, night by night, certainly, <coughs> eventually we'll get there. There is equally more hope in the very party that I joined, Alliance for National Transformation. We are putting together <laughs> leaders. I haven't seen it in for We are putting together <laughs> leaders apart from is it that, um, that are focused <laughs> on values, values that will build the very institutional framework of our country. Thank you. Thank you and may God Thank you so much, Honorable Gerald Karuhanga. Thank you, gentlemen and lady, for the time you have given us. And talking about value, tonight you have added value into our understanding of these issues. The Chinese have, Chinese have a saying that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a step. I believe we have taken our step, Uganda. And since you have ended at, at the note of hope, let us be hopeful. And when you get that ballot, like they always say, honor that ballot. And from an informed position, make your choice for the better of our country. And we're going to end there, but we shall continue the discussion with another as, uh, group of panelists to see this reality check of campaign promises and service delivery. Thank you so much. Welcome back. This is a continuation of our discussion on election promises, political accountability, and service delivery, a reality check. And so now we are changing gears. We have a new group of panelists who will be discussing the same, taking us to another level. From the Center for Constitutional Governance, I have Sarah Bireti. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you, Kamara, and good evening, viewers. And we have a voter, a member of the community from Seta Mukono. He is Mr. Luanga Charles Butai. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, sir. And we are also joined online. We'll be joined by two people, by Mr. Andrew Karamagi and also uh, Honorable Anna Deke. Honorable Anna Deke is joining us from uh, Soroti uh, District. Uh, good evening, uh, Honorable. Good evening to you, Patrick. And, and, and also we have Mr. Andrew Karamagi. Good evening, Andrew Karamagi. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Good evening. 
I understand, Honorable Anna Deke, you are combing all the areas of Soroti. We want to begin with you because it looks like you are in a tough situation. Not tough, tough as in the meaning. You are dazzling the people of Soroti so that they can give you a mandate. Um, let me begin with you. Uh, I don't know whether you listened to the keynote address that was given by the Honorable, uh, by Mr. Dr. Kabumba Businje. In practice, how do elections affect service delivery? What do we need to do as the people of Uganda to ensure that we have the leaders we deserve, but when they are in power or in positions of authority, we can also be able to hold them to account? Honorable Anadeke. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, greetings to everyone, to all the viewers. I'm very happy to be a part of this great discussion. So I think that um, elections would affect service delivery. They come once every five years. Almost all the plans of the financial year preceding to the elect elections is affected because all the finances are rechanneled and they are easily diverted. It's also very difficult to follow up with the development projects that feature in the budget of that financial year. I think that uh, what we could do to increase service delivery and accountability for, for example, for the for parliament to have better service delivery, I think that um, the right of recall, which is something that doesn't exist, that only existed under the movement party system, should be something that the parliament should review. Because now that we are outside the movement system, the right to recall does not exist anymore. Um, but I also think that uh, maybe it works to the benefit of members of parliament because electorates have very, very much misunderstood the roles of a member of parliament. Um, maybe because of deliberate, deliberate efforts or actions by MPs, but also because we exist in a, a state that has failed institutions. And so everything go, it goes around an individual, the individual, the MP, the personality of the MP, the personality of the councillors, and all the other elected leaders, because all the other systems are not in place, they are not strong enough. So even if I told you that we would need the right to of recall to be reinstituted in the multi-party system, I think and I'm wary with good reason that if it does come back, it will be misused. I think that what we need to focus on is to build institutions that can ensure adequate service delivery and also ensure that the, the, the challenges or the shortcomings of um, the process of service delivery are checks like the rampant or high levels of corruption can be effectively curbed with you know effective prosecution and even refund of citizens' money. So I think that if we really want accountability, we need to focus on strengthening the institutions of state, focus on eventually Re, re, reintroducing the right of recall, eventually, not as one of first instance, because it will be very problematic and highly misused. If we do have functional institutions of state, functional systems, then we can secure Ugandans and secure the institutions to be able to deliver on their mandate. Say, for instance, um, we have all, all these government ministries that have budgets allocated to them. But at the end of the financial year, you find that a road that was allocated under the Ministry of Works has not been worked, worked upon. You find that it features in every other financial year. It's the same road, it's the same bridge. They'll tell you we are working on the Palisa Road. It will be there in financial year A, and it will feature until financial year D. So if we did have strong institutions in place, and we had strict adherence to the separation of powers, then I think that service delivery would really be effective. Okay. Andrew Karamagi, before I get into, to, before I, I have the panelists in the studio getting, I, I want you to hear you here. There are gaps between promises and service delivery. 
where do you think is the problem? The question that you have posed is timely um, because it presumes about four things, Kamara. The question presumes that we are citizens. Uh, it presumes that we have functional and independent institutions. That question also presumes that uh, politicians or political leaders elected or appointed know why they hold the positions that they hold. And in my estimation or my final analysis, it's that what we call erroneously, who the people we refer to as citizens, in many ways behave and think and act like inhabitants or mere residents who do not appreciate their civic role. And so social services are then viewed as gifts or tokens from leaders uh, issued as part of the benevolence of an individual leader and not an outcome of the social contract, which is the relationship between the elected uh, and those who uh, do the actual voting to get these people into those offices. And that brings me to the point on electoral cycle. These conversations often happen when an election is a few months away, uh, but not never happen just after an election, which means that we think that an election is an event, whereas an election is a process. Leaders should be held accountable from the day that they step into office up to the next electoral cycle. Unfortunately, right now, we look at this as an event, what's going to happen in Feb or March next year, as opposed to looking at it from the point of view and say that my colleague, for instance, Adeke Anna, was voted in 2016, and we are assessing her for the five years that she has been in office, not just that uh, moment of the election. I think it's also important to preface my submission by saying that when we talk about democratic accountability, exactly what do we mean? What are the standards? Um, does any road pass as delivery? Um, how responsive are those that we've put in office? And how enforceable, in fact, is this democratic accountability? And how answerable are these people in, in office? Objective 26, Kamara, of the Constitution, under the National Objectives and Directive Principles of State Policy, uh, states that all persons placed in positions of leadership and responsibility shall, in their work, be answerable to the people. The question is, are these people, in fact, uh, measuring up to the mark provided by Objective 26 of the Constitution, or Principle 14 of the same Constitution under the Directive Principles of State Policy, which requires that the state shall deliver on all these fundamental rights of, of Ugandans. In particular, it talks about education, health care, clean water, and other such services, including decent shelter, adequate clothing, food, security, uh, and even retirement benefits. This is also taken care of by international conventions that we as Uganda are part of, such as the International Covenant on Economic, uh, Social and Cultural Rights, um, Articles 11 and 12, which specifically undergird the rights to water, physical and mental health. So if you do not have uh, citizens who appreciate this social contract, that this person is voted not so much because uh, you know, of how many burials they are able to attend, uh, how much alcohol they're able to buy us during a campaign rally, but that there is an obligation created, a social contract created by the electoral process, then we still have a problem. And I will leave, I'll end this intro here by asking a question that we need to answer in conversations like this. Are we building a nation or we're building a state? And when we talk about ideals like patriotism, or processes like an election, are we pushing for blind allegiance to the hardware of the state, police, institutions, the military, and, and, and other such things? Or are we ensuring that an election is not an ethnic or religious census, but actually a process that helps us hold to account those that we uh, send to represent or lead us? All right. Patrick. 
All right, Andrew Karamagi there, joining us, by the way, from South Africa. Uh, earlier we had Anna Deke joining us from Soroti. Now in the studio have uh, Madam Sarah Birete and uh, Mr. Luanga Charles Butai. Sarah Birete, uh, you know, in your perspective as, as a constitutional practitioner from the Center for Constitutional Governance where you sit, where do you think is the problem? Yeah, thank that you, the Kamara. People can promise, hmm. they can deliver, and we live like that. Kamara, constitutionalism presupposes three principles. One is a belief in the constitution by a big section of leaders and citizens. Second is reference to the constitution on a day-to-day -day basis by the work of leaders and public service holders. Reference to it. Yes. And the third element is ability to defend the constitution by organized entities of society. These are civil society organizations, political parties, and other civic agencies. So the question we should ask as we examine constitutionalism in Uganda, and going back to the presentation by Dr. Kabumba, do these conditions exist in Uganda? And my, anth my answer is no. We do not have a belief in the constitution right from the fountain of honor, who at one time referred to the constitution as a mere piece of paper, we do not have a belief in the Constitution, and I can bet that 90% of public offices in Uganda do not even have a single copy of the Constitution. We do not have organized entities with the ability to defend and protect the Constitution at all levels. We have civil societies that are encumbered by you know, unreasonable and unfair intrusion of government. We have political parties that are in this way. We see what is happening to, to, to a cross-section of political parties in this, in this country when the election season has already begun. We do not have ability to organize citizens to engage in a constitutional democracy But, but sir, when you country. talk about the constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, that mandates uh, government or whoever to translate that law that into the local languages do people even understand the supreme law of the land because it's not in their language that's where, that's where I'm coming from Kamara so what is the character of a citizen that should defend constitutional governance that should enable constitutional governance to flourish this citizen, we, we must, must be very active, engaged in the day-to-day -day affairs of, of governance. We, this citizen must have knowledge and skills with ability to understand, for example, the Constitution. That is a best governance document. This citizen must have a trait or a traceable civic character with ability to hold leaders accountable and demand for service delivery, the question of the day-to-day. Do we have this type of citizen in Uganda? If you get that type of citizen in Uganda, doesn't that become a danger or a threat to the status quo? Why, why would an active citizen be a danger is that, to, to, is to, that, to a democratic is, is that governance? The, do you think is that the citizen the NRM government would welcome? Why, why would, for example, the, the question is then that is the, the, the NRM government able or can we qualify it as a democratic government? That is the question. A democratic government cannot be scared of an active citizen. But when you have a situation to say that if we had this kind of citizen who is required to enable constitutional governance to flourish, then this citizen becomes a threat. Then that means that we do not have democracy in this let me, country. Let me bring in Mr. Charles Luanga Butai. You are a, a voter, a member of the community in Santa Mukono, Santa Mukono. And I know at this time people are coming to you and your members in the village to ask for a vote so that you can elect them. What do the people in your village in Seta in Mukono consider when they want to vote a leader? And if that leader does not make good of his promise, does not you know, provide what he has promised, can the people go back to him and say, look, on this one, you haven't done anything? So the good thing I know, many people in our community in said is most special. When times come to vote, mm -hmm. uh, they always re refer someone 
who tells us something, but yet at the end, uh, they don't deliver what they have promised. Maybe uh, the, the money they have spent in the election, look, that is what? Mm -hmm. They need to first recover that money. Mr. Luanga, so you're telling us that uh, sometimes the leaders, you know what, deceive, tell a lie. That, they lie. That is it. So now, that if these it. leaders have lied and they are in office, is there anything the community members can do? Um, maybe say, okay, when he comes back, maybe you don't give him a vote. You deny him a vote. Or he can lie you this, this time and lie you the next time and, and you keep in the lies. You know, you know those those leaders. They have a lot of friends in our mm. community, and if you try to to attack them, eh, you never know what what can happen to you. Eh? <laughs> but what we think, mm -hmm. if God, God can allow us to get uh, good leaders to come and do good work in our community. You just want if you could only get good leaders. I don't know. I don't know, Honorable Anna. That they always, they, yes. they always promise us that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they failed somewhere. That's what I can see. Wow. Uh, okay. Let, let me let me let me go back to South Africa. I think I should be having Andrew, Kar Andrew Karamagi still online on Zoom. And I suppose you could have listened to Mr. Charles Butai, who is a, a voter from SETA. We just wanted to have this perspective because at this time, people like him probably are going to be responsible for the leaders we're going to have. Because with all respect, perhaps, Karamagi, you'd be in South Africa, you won't be able to vote. But they will vote. And the people they vote are the people who will be our leaders. What can people like him and do, do um, now that you have listened to him? Kamara, the, the people, the voters, need to begin from the point of appreciating the concept of an election. The, 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 the word basically comes from the word elect, which means to choose. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what are you choosing? Are you choosing, is this an elect, like I mentioned earlier, is this an ethnic census? Is this a religious census? Or it's a census of the issues that have been presented? Um, and if we navigate that safely and rise or lift the debate from merely uh, what is being given out, the person who attends the most burials, then we can have outcomes um, from the people that we vote. Secondly, uh, I need to put this footnote. What is the role? Let's talk about legislators, for instance. What is their particular role? Um, you find the kind of promises that they, be, that they are making to their voters have nothing to do with what is in the Constitution or the acts that create institutions, uh, the institutions that they serve or belong to. So no one is talking about le legislation, no one is talking about representation, appropriation, or oversight. They're all promising things that should be outcomes of their legislative work. They're promising hospitals, they're buying ambulances, and these things look good, they attract the cameras, they excite the voters, when in fact they do not answer the problems, the actual issues that, cons that should be of concern to the voters. So I would start from by recommending an appreciation of this election process. And I'm tempted to suggest that we could even have a discussion on if Kamara and I are contesting and we are debating healthcare, what type of healthcare? Is it state funded? Is, should we allow private providers to, private service providers to provide this insurance? Or should it be exclusively the state or the, or the market? But maybe we've not reached there as a population, as a society. But I think that's the level of inquiry that we should be making as voters so that we are not shortchanged by leaders who offer us one slice of bread, yet we could take the whole loaf or even the bakery itself. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you, Andrew. Sarah, what in this election, for example, and this time, moving forward, if we are to have change, what should the citizens do to hold their leaders accountable? I, I think, first of all, we need to look at uh, the manner in which the, the social contract okay. is being negotiated. At the entry, when they are getting the mandate? Yes, and, and going by the curtain raiser, which is the, the NRM primaries, elections in this 2021 is likely to be a grand public auction whereby the highest bidder 
takes the public seats. Going by the money that, that we saw being distributed in NRM primaries, coupled with the violence, you know, an election that we described uh, as an election of guns, guns, and money. So if you have an election that is similar in all characteristics and manner, save for absence of civility, to a public auction, so what kind of terms and <coughs> conditions do we have that the people are negotiating the social contract? What issues will emerge in, an, in, a, in a nature of an election that is a public auction? And, and I think leaders in this country, especially NRM leaders, should be concerned but by the state of affairs in this country. Because we do not have an election, we have a public auction coupled with violence. Well, Mr. Luanga Butai, yes, I can imagine the people who are going to be our leaders in Mukono, in Kampala, and Uganda will be our leaders because the people, you and I and the majority, will have decided. So this time around, how do you ensure that they are not lying to you. You are not lied to. I don't think whether we can find a, a solution. Because many of us in our communities, we feel intimidated. If you try to mention something which is real, you know what can happen to you. But uh, like uh, the, another thing I want to talk about, the in hospitals hospitals. I remember my firstborn, uh, we went to Mulago. I used to escort my wife to Mulago. Mm -hmm. By the time she used to go there for a checkup, I used to go with her. What happened there? If you don't if you reach there, you don't bribe someone. I don't know when it is, that one is going to end. If you don't bribe someone. So you have to bribe your way. In, in a corridor. You stay in a, a long line there, up to. You reach there as R7, you left the hospital around two, you, though you reach there in time. But if you don't right. go into, you in, you go into your pockets, <laughs> you'll stay there. But leave alone the first people who came first to receive. But for you, if you come with enough money, something, you get, you bribe someone. Then another child, my second child was born in 2014 in Mukono. That was, that is, by then it was health center for. You used to go there, you, you sit in the line, on the, on the benches. Uh, they used to ask you, have you come with a book and a pen? What are the doctors going to write for your results? And you go outside, you buy it. Then after, find what is, what is, what is happening to you or to your wife. They give you, what they should give you only, Panadol and they write for another drug to go for a nearby pharmacies and right. drug shop so that you can buy another medicine expensively. But I don't know the person you are willing to vote this time around. They will have a heart of helping us. But now, if you are telling us that, and it's really a sad story, and you're giving your own personal experience, why do the people now keep voting such leaders who cannot help end corruption, who cannot help put things straight. And you may sometimes you may find somebody is getting one Kisanja, second, third Kisanja, these days. Why don't people An change? Another problem mm. in our community, we always get new people coming from other sides. Okay. And yet you, they want to vote right from there. Maybe uh, they, don't, they don't understand the honorable, was, how has been performing. Uh, performing in the community. Oh, they just listen to 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 him or somewhere on TV's radio. I just said that this one can perform, but he, as we the community members, we can no, we can understand. Pick someone who can give us good delivery. So, yeah. do you think now where and we what are? What you don't need to forget. Mm. I'll I'll answer some of the questions, but I, I'm self-taught. You don't need to. Forget oh, you're a self-taught man. <laughs> I'm self told I uh, didn't go far with my studies. I ended up somewhere. Uh, you are a very intelligent man. I'm humbled thank by you, that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> let, me, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me go to Andrew Karamagi. Andrew Karamagi in South Africa, the man you have just listened to here, is really giving us an expose of sorts. So, what do you make of that? Uh, Patrick, 
I, I, I'm, I'm still, I would insist, I, 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 I like to hit this drum until it can't get any sound out of it. Um, the ultimate outcome of an electoral process really based on the presumptions that we've discussed and that we've agreed between you, myself, and the gentleman in the studio, is that you must have a population that, and even individual voters who possess the competence to uh, understand the process and then participate and not be participated. Um, if you're thinking of young people or, uh, you know, even, even people middle-aged and so on, are we choosing the leaders or we're, be, or we're having the leaders choose who votes for them and how they vote for them? So really it's about, number one, appreciating the process, taking part, but also having the competence to know that this is not an event, this is a process. It starts from the day the individual is elected and knowing what to claim. And I liked Adeke's point on the power of recall. How, what do we do to an individual who gets in on these glowing promises, but midway or somewhere along the electoral term, um, steps outside the mandate that they were given? Uh, fortunately, as we've seen with the chaotic elections that were held, the internal primaries that were held for the NRM, there was a bit of, you could call that accountability, where many of those who voted for the amendment of the constitution to remove the age limit uh, were penalized by the voters by the internal primaries which did not return them to run for the next election but i think that kind of accountability is what we need to see more of where there are consequences there's a price to pay for action or inaction on the part of leaders or representatives kamara okay um Thank you so much, um, Andrew. Let me, let me come back to, to Sarah. Uh, you know, everybody who spoke here, there's that sense of hope uh, that we shall make it. Uganda have had a tumultuous past. You know, that maybe with all these, you know, experiments we are making, do you, carry, do you have that sense of hope that, because I can see a new breed of Ugandans, especially now with the advanced technologies of communication, people are sharing, people are talking. Uh, Probably now the politicians are going to find a very different voter than in the past. True, and uh, I wish, I only wish we had an enabling situation to enable proper quantification of the will of the voter. Because on several accounts we have had contestations on election results, with some sections alleging rigging and others saying they've won genuinely. So whether the voter, what the voter votes for, whether it can count or not, for now we are saying the mandate is for electoral commission. But we have had on several occasions where electoral commission is dragged to court and actually loses on the, on the basis of failure to organize a free and fair election. Citizens have advanced, yes, in technology, in terms of access to information, in terms of many people who know the bad acts of governance happening in this country. And that is maybe what is causing fear and panic on, on the part of people holding power. So shall we have legitimate leaders at the end of 2021 elections? Do we have an enabling environment to properly quantify the will of the people? And is the Electoral Commission prepared to hold a free and fair election as mandated by the, by the Constitution? I think those are the questions. But I don't doubt the capacity of citizens to express what they want in a secret ballot. I don't doubt that. You, you have that hope. But uh, Mr. Butai, I just want you for now, because the people of, of, of uh, Mokono and Seta are watching you right now. I just, can, can you engage them, let me say, in Luganda, for example, uh, on, on, on what you have been able to see and what maybe we can do differently? Because now, if we, probably they could miss out. Chamba Denge Zakonzo Okulava, Echigenda Maso, Nadambi, Ebiokuron, David Jam. Avant to Bandiva Debate, Kateka Bulunin, or Kuvanti, Simayova campaign is in Agenda Maso. Abantu to Twagen and Amoradis, no mania, or Richa Gambino, no Chagambino, no Mupia, Nesima Vachina Sovaka this time round. Name but day, 
nsaba abantu uliriza na abantu labe sawe no nsoka kweba zate ntv yolo kumpita ate mu studio mu kumurundi ogusoka i'm really really happy it's, it's a, a great moment to me so tusaba tufuno embere yobukaka mu tugenda mu electionism wanga nebo tusa ku munno obulabe te chiku wanyoma kuru na yolo kubanti buli muntu aina different mind at his own or her own ne tusaba kusabika tonda gwe tongero kola tutase embera yona jitusubira nte izo kubera ho aba bwe tunaba tusaze wo kulonda tuwalonde mazima naye twalabiyo kufuku tuko kwa baddo wanu primaries za uh, in a civil nature we don't like that violence anymore we don't like it so to sababu sabi bechi kuata kobo na waba kusize wali ate to teda te webitio nega dize mbade muyo kuronda mbade mwe miaka mijine i'm feeling i'm really, really fed up with the elections i'm telling you because i'm gaining nothing at all and nsaba betu subi lanti mutu subi loku joku tuja mogu dudu kwa fe ebi bi mutu gambi la dala bi obote kamu nyo manifesto bi muta demo kutukolela bi mba mutu kiza so kutuli mbali mbo la time la time uja you convince us you end up looking for your families only but you have to be to yamba nyo thank you Thank you. I, th I think you've had, he's speaking from the heart. Um, a very passionate man who understands these things. He's been in election as a voter and he has been able to watch. He has a wealth of experience when it comes to elections and in most cases, people are not ready to make good of their promises. Um, it looks like, Andrew, do you realize that there seems to be a, a breed of Ugandans who are now can cut through the lies and are saying, you know what, enough. I am I am I am alive to the context within which this election is or elections are being held and I would refer the audience and yourself to an instructive book by Sandrine Perot, Sabiti Makara and others on elections in a hybrid regime. Uh, it's it's, an, it's it, the text looks at the 2016 election and many of the issues that it raises regarding a hybrid regime, com electoral competition in a hybrid regime, are important for this discussion. We can talk about civic competence and independent institutions, but as long as an election is being held under the barrel of the gun, um, just take the example of the previous internal primaries held by the NRM, we need to cut some slack or lower our expectations regarding how much output we are looking for from a process that is militarized, uh, taken over by the intelligence and uh, security community in a fashion that strips it of the free and fair aspects that should define an election. I really would like that to also feature as part of this conversation. We should talk about the supply side, yes, but we should also discuss the demand side and the context within which such processes are being held. Otherwise, we run the risk of misleading the population and also drawing wrong conclusions about what elections mean for service delivery. I will pop you and talk about the you know, statements made by the incumbent and other leaders who like to say, you send me the wrong people, that's why you have no services. Such a statement in any other country would lead to serious consequences. But the fact that it's repeatedly said um, by no less than the uh, holder of the highest office really shows you the kind of trouble we have in terms of holding a free and fair process. All right, okay, thank you so much. The, strengthening the demand side, I, th I think, you know, the civic competence, is, I think, is the most important thing I've heard today. From you, Sarah, but before that, also from uh, Edgar Tavaro and the other colleagues that were here. How do we do that? Yeah, basically, that is supposed to be done through continuous civic education. The Constitution mandates the Uganda Human Rights Commission to popularize the Constitution as well as conduct continuous civic education. The Human Rights Commission has on several accounts 
asked parliament to give it money to conduct civic education, but they don't get this money. The few scattered efforts we have of a semblance of civic education in this country are efforts by civil society organizations. Civil society organizations are supposed to play a complementary role, but in this aspect, they complement nothing. So they are the only agencies conducting civic education. And we know the, the changes that happened in the curriculum in this country in early 1990s that took away several elements of civic education from our education curriculum in several institutions of learning, including what we used to call civics. Civics, yes. Yeah, include up to university level in an attempt to depoliticize the education but taking away the element of active citizenry completely as a design of the NRM regime. Electoral Commission is supposed under this phase to be conducting voter education. But voter education is basically how to guide voters on how to vote. I don't think it even addresses elements of, of rights and duties of leaders as well as obligations of citizens. It does not. So this is the background. This is where we are coming from as a people as we go into this election. I've just started seeing a few ad adverts from Electoral Commission. Electoral Commission is on record for having said they only got an allocation of 800 million to conduct voter education in 137 districts in this country. Th that's peanuts. They can't do ma much beyond media adverts. Yet we have parts of this country that are not covered by, 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 by mainstream media. Then on the other side, we also have, for example, the recent regulations by Uganda Communications Commission curtailing efforts, cut citizens' own efforts at informing themselves and exchanging information through draconian regulations. We all know that use of social media pro uh, platforms comes with terms and conditions by the creators of these platforms. They have self-regulating mechanisms. On several accounts, Twitter has taken down people's accounts on, an, on, an, on the basis of abusive content. Yet you have an entity now, UCC, masquerading to regulate Twitter, a self-regulating application where people pay data to access. So on top of enacting OTT, maybe also to inform voters that on top of punishing incumbent MPs for having lifted age limit, other MPs were also voted out on, a, on account of passing the OTT law. So you have OTT already, which is an additional burden to access to internet in this country, and then you see, see draconian regulations, which we are challenging in court as Center for Constitutional Governance, because they contradict Article 29 of the Constitution on, on access to information and freedom of expression and association. So this is the backdrop where citizens are coming from to go into the 2021 elections amidst COVID pandemic. Uh, well, the biggest bulk or the biggest part of our population are young people. And I can imagine the young people, the youth are going to determine the direction of our country. The people they decide to choose, they will be our leaders. So if you are to give advice to those who have the mandate to vote because largely we are a young country and the young people are going to be responsible for where, which direction we take. Do you, and the young people now have also contenders in this election almost at every level. Do you think we are slowly getting young people who this time around are going to be different? We have about approximately about 9 million voters who are aged 30 years and below in this election. Most of these young people... And the majority of these people are young people. They are quite informed. They are active. We have seen a big chunk of them because the majority of them have decided to join people power, which is now I don't know whether it is NOOP or not, but the challenges going on in court where also state agencies are, have been brought into question about their actions. Yes, young people are going to determine 
the next election because they are the majority voters. Okay, um, Mr. Butai, in the in the Mukono there, what? How actively involved are the youth? And and you think um, probably now they will channel their community and our country to a better direction because. Like Sarah has said, there are 9 million registered voters at 30 and below. Those are the ones that are going to determine where we are going. But I, what I think, mm. I always move around and talk to the, to talk to the youth. Eh? Many of them are not, going, don't, they are not willing to vote because even they don't know whom they are going to vote. Don't uh, expect that one to be. To rule, don't rule it out in your mind. They are no, many of them, they are not going to vote because... Many of them, they are jobless. They look at today's ends meet, but don't think they will go and in that line to vote someone whom they don't know. But if they have a problem, mm. do, that is that problem. can they maybe blame that problem on the leaders? Can they look among those who are coming in uh, asking for a vote who maybe can help them in their joblessness and, and the frustrations that they have? So I thought when they have a problem, then that can become an incentive for them to go in the lines and vote. But what I've told you, a few will go there, but many of them, they won't go to vote. Have they voted in any primaries? Ah, only that. There were a bribe somewhere. I remember <laughs> someone voted here, and then he ran to <laughs> another polling station. <laughs> Me, I don't involve in those. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. OK. That's what happened. But me, I we wasn't in those. Okay. Primaries. Uh, Andrew, um, in your comfort uh, there in South Africa, we bring you Charles Luanga to give you a real feel um, of a Ugandan voter where they are. And, and there's some kind of a voter apathy, I suppose. Probably they think the vote does not matter, uh, it does not can't change their lives, and so they're like, why, why should we even waste our time to get into the lines? What do you make of that, Andrew? I, I understand the the apathy and the despondency that characterizes how we view uh, processes like these ones. I, I, I'm not I'm not immune to feeling such, uh, you know, experiencing those kinds of feelings. However, I would, in the same breath, uh, implore my fellow young people to stop behaving. Stop being uh, a majority that behaves with a minority mindset. We need to do two things. Number one, let's define irreducible minimums. Things that we all push for, regardless of which party we belong to, which religion we profess, which ethnic group we're from, and which social class we belong to. Um, if we pull, pull, all pull for maternal health care as a, as a minimum that all parties should have in their manifestos, call for uh, uh, free education um, at, at primary, secondary, and similar arrangements at the university level. We define those basic irreducible minimums. That way we will begin to behave as a constituency. Because right now, yes, we have the numbers, but those numbers will not mean much if we don't translate them into energy and harness them into some kind of force that can uh, compel our leaders and representatives to have these issues on the national agenda. Uh, finally, on this point is that direction is more important than speed. Where are we headed as, 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 a, as a demographic, as a social group, as a class? What are we pushing for? And what gains are we making? What did we push for in 2011? What did we achieve? What did we miss out on? What did we? What gains were made in 2016, and what gains are we looking for in 26 uh, in in the next election? So, I would really urge fellow young people to look at this as a as a as a reason to behave as a constituency. NRM, FDC, NUP, all these parties to behave as a constituency and have those basic minimums below which we can't negotiate. We can disagree on other things, policy, implementation, and whatnot, but those should be minimums. That way we behave as a whole and can hold these people who lead us accountable. 
Okay, I'm, I'm tempted to think in this discussion maybe we have to engage other Ugandans on the phone. Um, so I'm going to open the lines. I'll ask my producer to open the lines so that at least we get a few uh, comments or questions because it is possible we can sit in a studio like this and, and think we're making sense, but we're making sense to ourselves. And yet you, who is also heavily involved in this, you should say something. So briefly, uh, maybe one or two people uh, tell us what you think about um, campaign promises and service delivery. I have a call online. Hello. Okay. Um, so, 9 million registered voters who are 30 and below. Yes. That is, I'm sure, the group that everybody is trying to woo and dazzle and, and make sure they give them the mandate. And at, and at least now we've had people who have gone to school through universal primary education and UCE and all that kind of stuff. And we, we have... Uh, penetration of uh, communication technologies, uh, Ugandans are engaging. And if you do something today in Kisoro, people in Karamoja that evening will know what has happened. If you do it in Kalangala, somewhere in Koboko, people have known what has happened. So I think now more than ever, I see you know, a silver lining in the dark cloud, Uganda's political dark cloud, that you, Ugandans are waking up. True, Ugandans are waking up, and the youth are very active. I, I, I was surprised the, by Charles's comment that the youth are not active in Mukono. But as we watched the, the biggest party primary of NRM, young people were very active in the, in the media scenes that we saw. And some of the areas where we observed the elections as, as civil society agencies. But, but going back to, to Andrew's point, what are the issues that should determine this election? If at all, it, it will be issue-based. I, I think we need to look at, for example, the two key promises by, by NRM in, 20, in 2016 under the Chisanja Hakuna Muchezo. Mm -hmm. If you look at the promise of the middle-income status, I, I, I think we only have seven towns in Uganda that have attained middle-income status. And those include Kampala, Wakiso, Mukono, Mbarara, Mpiji, Masaka. Yeah, and Masaka. Only the towns. So the rest of the country, that is even less than, I, I think it can be 0.1%. Mm -hmm. So that's how far the, the, the regime has delivered on that front. We had a, a public promise that later led, uh, led into arrests of, of some activists. The promise of sanitary pads for girls. It, it might appear simplistic in terms of, 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 of meaning. But if anybody has engaged with the crisis of, of menstrual hygiene uh, and the rate of school dropouts, leave alone the teenage pre pregnancies that have happened during COVID pandemic. M menstrual health is an important element for keeping a girl child in school. And I think we need to demand okay. that this premise is revisited. I, I think that's a very important issue, but uh, just pause there so that I can engage uh, other people who are online, they want to talk to us. You have somebody, on, we have someone online, hello. Hello. Yes, good evening, sir. What's your name? Where are you calling yes. from? Good. Yes, go right ahead. Good evening, sir. I'm from Kayunga. Okay. Uh, no problem. Um, you are saying they dishing out, dishing out money in broad daylight. People no longer even are not even scared. Yeah. Let, let me take another call on. Hello. 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 Yes. Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Timothy. I'm calling from Kireka. You are on air. Uh, yes. I'm um, happy to to call on the NGP. Okay. What is going on around in the country? Mm -hmm. We need our leaders to come to God. Okay. Because if they get the mass of God, mm -hmm. is when they will allow people to do what they want. 
Okay. Thank you. Wow. Uh, they need to return to the Lord. Uh, um, I'm, I'm told you have another call online. Um, let me just maybe take one more or two and then we can conclude this. Hello. 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 Yes, good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Yes, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Okay. Um, fortunately, we have comes issues with that one. Uh, probably I jump to the next. Hello. Hello. Good evening, sir. What's your name? Good evening, how are you? What's your name, sir? I'm calling Sentamu. Where are you calling from, Mr. Sentamu? I'm calling from Makito. Okay, go right ahead, sir. Yeah, I do believe that the election can change a country, mm -hmm. but not Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> we are a part of... Uh, the, there, are, there are some people who believe that Election can change Uganda, mm. but it cannot. What we can change is how people think. Mm? Okay. You hear it? So, I, want, I want you to qualify more the statement you have made and substantiate it. I'm a youth, mm. I'm a youth but I don't think we can vote them. Okay. All right. Mr. Sentamu, I want to thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to take any more calls because of time. And I uh, have one more. Okay. Uh, I have a call. Hello? 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 All right. All right. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. What's your name? Okay. I'm Hassan. I'm sorry? I'm Hassan. Hassan, you're on air. Go right ahead. No, I do it, Mr. Wanga. Hmm. With the election in Uganda, mm. there's been more than two months. Okay. I have not done this in Uganda. All right. Thank you so much, Hassan. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Andrew Karamagi in South Africa, in a few seconds, if you can give us your parting shot. My parting shot um, will go to the constituency or demographic that I belong to which is young people. And I will reiterate the point on us, uh, the need to stop behaving like a minority, yet we, in fact, are a majority. Elections are not a time to be bought and sold like pancakes. It is a time to hold those who want mandates to lead or serve or represent us accountable. And as such, we have to have certain issues that we require of them, whether they are individuals or political parties. At the same time, I will end by saying I am alive to uh, the environment within which we are discussing a concept like elections, which is militarized, uh, heavily monetized, and where you have institutions of the state that should be independent, acting like wings of the ruling uh, establishment. To that end, these are issues that should concern all of us, both the governed and the governors or the leaders and the led, or in the case of the what we call leaders, the rulers, um, who should you know, appreciate these facts and think about the future as opposed to their own stomachs or other narrow interests that define their all right. All behavior. Right. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Andrew Karamagi, who's been joining us on, on Zoom from South Africa. And since you are there, maybe I can say, see bonga. Thank you. Um, your concluding remark, Mr. Butai, Br very briefly. Uh, I, I would like to thank the NTV, the, uh, the organizers of this conference, the annual national conference 2020, to having chosen me to come to uh, MTV studio for the first time. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And Ms. I wish my people who loves me a good life. Thank you, like Mr. Him. Luanga Charles Butai from Seta Mukono. Sarah, your parting shot. Yeah, my, my first call is to citizens. I, I want to call upon all registered voters to turn up and vote. It's their duty under Article 17 of the Constitution it's their duty to this country as citizens. We know we have challenges in quantifying who has won and who has lost, but let's first do our duty. 
because you can vote and you also have ability and capacity to guard your vote. Secondly, I want to address the issue of money in elections. Any leader who offers money in exchange for a vote has no place in the leadership in this country. They are not fit to lead you. If they are auctioneers, let them go and register auctioning companies and do that job. Please reject these bad leaders. Our country is our duty, and I call upon all of us to play our role. Thank you so much, Ms. Sarah Bireti from the Center for Constitutional Governance. We thank you so much, Mr. Charles Luanga Butai, and also Andrew Karamagi and Anna Deke, who joined us on, on, on Zoom. And all of you who have been a part of this discussion, we thank you for your great company. You have had 9 million uh, Ugandans who are registered voters are 30 years and below. You are responsible for where this country is going to go. Honor your vote, understand your leaders, and demand for better, because you deserve better. And that's it from here on this reality check show. Good night and God bless Uganda.